Good afternoon, Mr. Uh, Professor Conaghan. Mr. McLennan. Thank you, my lord. Uh, Professor Conaghan, you'll remember that before lunch I was asking you about the Cabinet Secretary's decision to halt the opening of the hospital. And in that context, I was asking you about the relative timing of the decision being uh, announced to the public or revealed to the public and being disclosed to NHS Lothian. You, you recall that? I, yes, I, would, about I, it. I, 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 I do recall that. Um, um, and there was just a, a document that I should put to you uh, for completeness, and that is at Bundle 7, Volume 1, page 98. Um, and you should see there, uh, it's a, an email from Callum Henderson, the Assistant Private Secretary to Malcolm Wright, um, to Mr Davidson, dated the 4th of July 2019. Uh, and we see there that it, the email is timed at 10 past four in the afternoon. Okay. Um, I understand that that is the email which sent out Malcolm Wright's letter that we were looking at this morning to Mr Davidson. Uh, so that may, give, that may indicate when uh, the correspondence was sent to Malcolm Wright. Do you know when the meeting took place uh, at which the content of that letter was uh, worked out? It certainly wasn't first thing in the morning. Um, if I'm going to give you a broad recollection of time and its number of years now, I think it was something like either late morning or early afternoon, uh, early afternoon, but most likely that meeting, I think, was late morning. Um, but that's the best I can re recollect on that. OK, and is, is it correct that the letter was drafted up after the meeting? Um, I, the final letter was drafted up after the meeting. I do recall that there was a draft of sorts that we um, looked at in the meeting, um, but... That was only a very rough draft. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> if I could return then to the subject of escalation, uh, you explain in your statement that NHS Lothian was, uh, uh, having been escalated to level three, as we discussed this morning, was then escalated to level four uh, in September 2019. Uh, and that particular escalation, that, that was in respect of the the RHCYP issues only, is that correct? Correct. Um, and was that a response to the reports which had by then been produced by NHS, NSS and KPMG? I, I, I couldn't tell you about the rationale for, the, uh, <clears throat> for, the, uh, for that particular oversight board on that level of escalation. That would have to be um, something like Christian McLaughlin, I believe, who was the first chair of that. Um, but if you ask me to give you an opinion on that, then that would certainly seem sensible that those reports were looked at and part of the decision making. I'm almost sure that there would have been a letter um, to Lothian on that escalation to level four, which set out the rationale. Um, in fact, if we go to paragraph 66 of your statement, which is in witness bundle uh, volume 1 uh, at page, I think it's 234, it's paragraph 66. Um, and we see there that you're addressing the question of the relationship between the NSS review and the KPMG audit and the escalation to level 4. Uh, and what you do is you quote from a report prepared by Christine McLaughlin in respect of that escalation. Correct. Um, and just 
reading from what she says, picking up from the second paragraph, this is you quoting her, um, she says, we've also received the two independent reports into the Royal Hospital for Children and Young People, taken together and based on advice from the Oversight Board for the RHCYP. Our assessment is that there are a broader range of issues that require to be addressed before the building can be fit for occupation. Um, and is it your understanding that the NSS report had identified uh, a broader range of issues to be addressed before the I, building? To, to, to be honest, I can't recall uh, at that stage um, anything connected with the NSS report. But if I can say, I would be surprised yeah. if that was not taken into account. OK, that's fine. And the <clears throat> again, if you don't know the answer to this, then then please say. But was it the case that the escalation to level four uh, was the was what allowed the Scottish government to provide additional managerial support in the form of Mary Morgan? Absolutely. Um, uh, Parts of the rationale from moving to level four escalation, which is quite a significant and in our view. Um, serious step in terms of an escalation process um, uh, is that uh, an oversight board is constructed. Um, we don't normally have that for level three, which is um, uh, of a lower level of dialogue and engagement. Um, but with the creation of an oversight board, we normally want to have um, a, a chair, uh, as well as perhaps the injection of additional expert um, help from outside the organisation. Uh, Mary Morgan was that, I think. Okay. And <clears throat> so we've seen then escalation to level three, then escalation to level four in relation to the, the project itself. Uh, in, in the context of the, the project to build the hospital as a whole, these escalations in the support framework came at the end, effectively, in order to deal with remedial works. Um, is there a... A case for saying that the government support came too late in that the, the health board really should have been given more support for the project at an earlier stage? Uh, well, of course, we didn't know about these issues before July. Okay? Um, uh, as I've said earlier, that um, uh, we had confidence in Lothian, as we do in other boards in Scotland, that they're, you know, it's not just Lothian that's taking forward big, um, big projects of that uh, of that sort. We had confidence in Lothian and other boards that they were efficiently equipped, both from an internal management perspective as well as from external um, um, technical advice, to be able to successfully deliver a project. So I wouldn't necessarily say that that was the case. But remember, of course, that... Um, each NHS board is subject to mid-year review and annual reviews, and um, we we assess the risk of delivery of various things in those reviews. Those annual reviews are chaired by a cabinet secretary and held in public, and there's a record of all of that. Okay. <clears throat> um, but building an acute hospital is a, a complicated thing to do. You accept that? Absolutely. Um, and doing it under a, a PFI or private finance style project structure brings probably extra complications to the task. I agree with that too. I broadly agree with that. Um, and we've heard evidence that many people within a health board, if they're doing it any time in their careers, may only do it once. It depends. That, that may be true, but I think you, you've kind of alluded to that earlier before lunch. And um, I made the point that bigger health boards would perhaps have even several projects ongoing at the same time. Mm -hmm. So there'd be a degree of embedded expertise in the bigger health boards. I'm not so sure about smaller health boards that might only have one project every dozen years of that of that ilk that needs that level of expertise injected into it. So I just qualify, qualify that yeah. answer a little bit. OK. I mean, if we just put this question to you, do you think there's sufficient recognition of um, the sort of relative degree of inexperience in, in that sort of big building project in the way that the NHS goes about its construction projects? Um, I think there's a recognition that um, uh, if I take a larger board, it might well be able to have more internal resources and less reliance 
on external um, advice. So there's more capability in there. Um, but I would probably agree, agree with you that for smaller health boards that don't have that critical mass, that have, might not have approached a programme of that size for a number of years, uh, that we need to think very carefully now and perhaps in the future about how we support them. And indeed, that brings us on to NHS Assure. Yes. Um, I mean, in general terms, how, how do you, given your, your current role as the, as the chair of a health board, how do you view NHS Assure and the, um, the approach that it takes to, to this uh, type of thing? Well, um, let me just say a couple of things in context before I directly answer that. And the, the contextual point here is um, most, if not all, big building projects in Scotland are paused because of financial considerations about availability of capital. So the, the first contextual point I want to make is that that gives us a little bit of time to be able to um, consider what lies behind the NHS issue process and what boards might need to have in place. Okay, I think there's a very important point made by some of the previous witnesses to this um, inquiry about the level of resource that might be required. And if I pick infection prevention and control nursing as an example that is, that is needed to support the aims and objectives of the um, of NHS Assure. Um, there are questions there about how do we have sufficient national training and I'll use the word standards again in terms of what we would expect as a response from health boards to input into that process and I think that still needs to be worked through and we've got a bit of time to do it. Um, but my general impression is that I welcome um, uh, NHS Assure. I particularly welcome the concept of key stage assur assurance reviews, which are inserted into the process as checks and balances for what we do. Um, and the last comment is, um, I, while I think I'm comfortable in terms of how the lines of accountability work between NHS Assure and health boards, um, uh, I, I just wonder if that's sufficiently clear to everyone. Okay, and you're referring there to the fact that responsibility for uh, the project and their compliance with guidance and standards and so on remains with the health boards, despite the fact that there's a perhaps a growing body of expertise within NHS Assure. Yes, it depends on where you put that level of accountability, but you could extend that concept to other um, uh, bodies of, for assurance, like, for instance, Healthcare Inspection Scotland. Yeah. Um, his, uh, to, to in, in short. So um, I, I just wonder if um, uh, it's it's sufficiently understood where the, those lines of accountability lie. I, I'm quite clear, and I think probably most senior leaders are, but others might need to be just a bit, bit assured. And the reason I reference that is that I read the target operating model, mm -hmm. which is contained in the bundle, which had a reference in, and this might have been a draft to joint accountability, um, and I also read the reference after that on Assure in terms of the letter that came from Richard McCallum to the service introducing Assure, which made it clear that there was a, that the split accountability there, boards are accountable for projects. And I think we might want to reconcile that. Um, but I may have been reading a draft of that uh, first document, the target operating model, so I might not reference it correctly. Okay. Now, you've been clear that you understand that the intention is that the... the um, responsibility for, for the projects themselves remains with the, the health boards. Do you think that that's the right approach to take? Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, NHS boards are um, um, uh, legal entities. Uh, they are, of course, got a line of accountability through the um, Director General to the Permanent Secretary for Financial Matters. And indeed, the Cabinet Secretary, as I've previously referenced, is accountable for the delivery of healthcare services to Parliament. Um, I think inserting another level or parallel accountability would be unworkable. And what, when you say unworkable, in, in, in what sense? Um, uh, confusion. Who's in, who's in charge? Who makes the decisions? Et cetera, et cetera. And do you see it as important to identify, insofar as possible, a, a sort of single point of responsibility for... Of the project? Uh, yes, I, I believe that's, that's important, but that single level of accountability or um, uh, actually exists 
just now. We, I think we call it Senior Responsible Officer, SRO for short, um, with a relationship to the Accountable Officer for the Board, which is the, obviously the Chief Exec. Mm. That's quite a common um, uh, framework for delivery of projects. <laughs> so Assure is, is built on the idea that that responsibility remains firmly in the Health Board. Um, you're thinking more broadly about it. Is is there a case for having major healthcare construction projects run not by the health boards, but by a centralised body, where you know perhaps for the whole of the NHS in Scotland, where um, a pool of uh, experience and expertise can be built up over over several projects? Uh, I'm not aware of any developed Western nation involved in, in you know the kind of level of healthcare that we would understand that has that as a as a, as a, a key part of his operational response to that um i think there's possibly a, a good case to be made for a central repository of knowledge and i think nhs assure attempts to do that um uh, but i would still leave in terms of my previous answer accountability with uh, with boards i don't think it would entirely be workable if everything was centralised. Mm. Uh, however, I have an open mind. Um, it would be good to be able to see the um, benefit and, and risks analysis of such an approach. Are, are there risks and potential disadvantages in building up a pool of expertise in one part of the NHS, so NHS Assure, but leaving the responsibility for the running of the projects and so on in a, in a different part of the NHS? Is, it, is there not a case for combining the two in the same place. Uh, well, um, I think you're asking me then, should we combine accountability? Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think um, I, I've already said that I don't think that's a wise thing. Okay. Um, um, uh, so I would, I would, very simple, just keep it separate. Yeah. Okay. Um, most of the questions I've been asking you today have been in relation to your hat that you formerly wore as a, a member of the Scottish Government or a, an official in the Scottish Government. Um, could I ask you now to put on your hat as the, the chair of NHS Lothian? Um, okay. Uh, are you aware that in response to the, the critical care ventilation issues at the, the RHCYP, the NHS Lothian commissioned a report from Grant Thornton into their governance and internal controls? On the yes, project? yes, I am. Um, and are you aware that Grant Thornton, at the end of the report, made various recommendations for NHS Lothian to strengthen those internal controls? Yes, there were, um, as I recall, um, six broad categories of recommendation and a rationale for that. And I also recall the Grant Thornton report had a man an initial management response against those each of those six recommendations. OK. Um, and uh, has NHS Lothian taken steps to... Um, implement those recommendations? Yes, it has. Um, if, you, um, if you do the audit trail of what happened to that report, you will see um, uh, senior officers in NHS Lothian being assigned responsibility, uh, principally Director of Finance, but also Director of Capital, to take forward various elements of those reports. Um, you will be able to track the progress of that um, uh, uh, through our Finance and Resources Committees, Audit and Risk Committee, and eventually our board. Um, you will be able to see the development against each of those recommendations, a particular framework. Um, that, that framework, again, passing through the various authorisation levels. So I think um, in answer to this, we are today, and this um, is, I know that you've uh, had um, evidence from um, Susan Goldsmith, this work continued well after um, and continues today, um, uh, beyond Susan Goldsmith with our current Director of Finance, Craig Marriott and others. Uh, so I think we can reference that we have, we have adequately dealt with each of the recommendations. The one thing I would say, though, is that because of the pausing capital projects, it is our desire to be able to test that in a real-life situation. We've not really been able, we've started to do that, but we're not able to finish that because of the pausing projects. And the last thing I would say about this is that we should view these frameworks as of changing, we were going to keep, we're going to keep them as a live document. Various versions will come back through our board. And the reason it's a live document is that we want to learn from the inquiry, but we also want to um, understand what's happening elsewhere in Scotland as a reference point. Okay, so 
can I take it from that that NHS Lothian is taking more into account than simply the recommendations made by Grant Thornton, but thinking more widely about how to address these issues of project control and governance and so on? Uh, yes, but driven largely by the original Grant Thornton report. Um, I mean, it raises a question about, um, which is in my mind, and I haven't made a view on this um, either way, as to whether or not the framework we have developed in response to the Grant Thornton recommendations should form the basis of some national view of what's right for a kind of framework. Um, I haven't come to a conclusion either way, but just to say that our framework is available um, I think it's available on our website, and just check that. But we have circulated it also to the Scottish Government and other colleagues, and we continue to develop it. So just to make sure I've understood that, you mean that whilst this is something that NHS Lothian has developed for its own purposes, it's potentially something of use to other health boards around the country? Could be. Yes. Could be. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of the other frameworks that other boards might have in this area. Um, so it begs the question, um, uh, if, if, if we've done the work in response to Grant Thornton, how useful is that in terms of forming, forming part of the governance of projects elsewhere in Scotland? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I haven't, I, I, it's just a, 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 a thought in my mind. I, I don't have an opinion either way. Um. You, you, you've referred to that developing framework and the inquiry has been supplied with documents by NHS Lothian about that. I don't think we need to go okay. to them just now. Um, but is there, in your view, is there anything more that needs to be done either by health boards or for health boards to improve their handling of capital projects of this type? A uh, couple of things might uh, occur. Um, I've already talked about uh, having perhaps for everyone in the NHS a better understanding of the accountability arrangements between the NHS Assure and um, uh, uh, boards. That, that's a relatively simple matter. But I think in, in considering this matter and listening to other witnesses, um, the question arises in my mind about the uh, workforce plan that we might put together on a national basis to be able to respond adequately to the NHS Assure processes. Um, uh, a question in my mind, particularly around infection prevention and control um, uh, numbers, uh, their training, their accreditation, and their ability to engage in a new sphere of work is something that we might consider on a national basis. Mm -hmm. Probably best done nationally because you don't run a training course for every health board. Yes. Okay? That's, that would be a, an SG responsibility for that. Um, and I've already talked about perhaps proactive sharing of assure findings in one project, um, and I'm sure they, I'm sure they will do this um, uh, in terms of their applicability of those findings to other projects in Scotland. In other words, learning from one project and making the lessons available to those doing projects. Absolutely in the right. Yeah. Um, Professor Conan, thank you very much. I don't have any more questions for you. It's possible that somebody else may do, so if you if you wait there for the time being. Thank you, my lord. Thank you, Mr. McLaren. Um What I propose, um, Professor, is that um, I'll ask you to return to the witness room for perhaps 10 minutes, just to check with um, the legal representatives in the room as to whether there's anything that they wish to be put to you. So if you go to 10, should be no more than 15 minutes.
Mr McLaren. Thank you, my Lord. Uh, there are no further questions for Professor Conaghan. Um, so, at least as far as I'm concerned, we can uh, proceed with Professor Fiona McQueen. McQueen. We'll bring Professor Conaghan back in and um, advise him of that. Um, we have no further questions uh, for you, Professor Conaghan, and therefore you're free to go. But before you do, um, can I express my thanks uh, for your attendance today, but also um, the time spent in preparing your statement. I very much appreciate this is a not inconsiderable task, um, a, and I'm grateful for you having carried out your... Uh, you have provided significant assistance to the inquiry, but you're now free to go. Thank you. Thank you a lot. So we'll now um, hear from Professor McQueen. Good afternoon, Professor McQueen. Now, as you understand, you're about to be asked some questions by Ms. McClellan, who is sitting opposite. But first, I understand you are prepared to um, uh, take the oath. My Lord, I am. Yes, thank yes. you. Good afternoon to you. Sitting where you are, could I ask you to raise your right hand and repeat these words after me? I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That I will tell the truth. That I will tell the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but Thank the truth. Thank you very much, Professor. Mr. McClellan. Thank you, my Lord. My Lord, may I be so bold as to interrupt? I'm no longer a professor, so it would be inappropriate for me to continue with that title if you're, um, if you're going to call me that. Mm -hmm. So, Ms. Mrs. Fiona, or accept that I'm no longer a professor and a, a slip of the tongue um, will go unnoticed. Right. That shows a very Apologies. proper, a uh, proper propriety. Um, what are you most comfortable with? I would be happy with Fiona, but I'm equally happy with Mrs. McQueen. Yeah, you know, Miss um, McLennan and I are rather formal people, so we'll, <laughs> um, I, think, I think I can like... speak for Mr. McLennan in that respect. So we, um, Miss McQueen, Mr. McLennan. Um, good afternoon, Mrs. McQueen. Good afternoon. Um, could I ask you just formally, please, to confirm your name? My name is Fiona McQueen. Uh, and have you provided a witness statement to the inquiry? I have. If we could have up on the screen, please, uh, the document at Witness Statement Bundle, Volume 1, page 129. <clears throat> do you see there on the screen uh, your witness statement? I do. And does that statement set out fully and truthfully your evidence on the matters that it addresses? It does. And is there anything in it, so far as you're aware, that needs to be changed or corrected? Not at the moment, no. Now, you were formerly the Chief Nursing Officer in the Scottish Government. Is that I was. correct? Uh, and that was between approximately 2014 and April of 2021. It was. Uh, and you describe yourself in your statement as semi retired, um, although it appears from your CV that you remain pretty active in public life. Indeed. Um, and, for example, you're the, the chair of the board of Ayrshire College. I am, yes. Uh, and a member of the Scottish Police Authority. I am, that's right. Um, but now retired from your full-time medical career. Exactly. Yep. Uh, and you are, I think, by professional qualification, a, a nurse. I am. Uh, so you, 
as we've just discussed, you were the chief nursing officer for seven years or so. Uh, could you just provide us with an overview of what that role entailed uh, over the time that you held it? So I would argue that fundamentally it's a professional leadership role and it provides professional advice to the ministerial teams, so the cabinet secretary and their ministers. It also provides professional leadership for nurses and midwives across Scotland. And um, as the chief nursing officer, are you the head of a, a, a directorate or a department within Indeed. the government? So it is a directorate within, within the government. So I would be a director within the Scottish government with director level responsibilities, reporting to the director general, who was the accountable officer for health and social care. And within that directorate, then there would be healthcare associated infection policy and antimicrobial resistance there would be workforce development for the professions, which would include commissioning of undergraduate nursing places, regulation of healthcare professionals, uh, some legislation we put through, but also being a general director of the, the Health and Social Care Directorate. Okay, and just give us a rough indication of the, the size of that directorate in terms of people and so on. So I can't remember exactly, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking around 80, but I couldn't be certain. Okay. Um, at paragraph six of your statement, uh, you identify parts of the remit of uh, that directorate uh, and you say that it includes leading on healthcare science and leading on all aspects of healthcare associated infection policy and antimicrobial resistance. Could you just expand a little bit on the work done in those areas when you were there? So the healthcare science is a healthcare science workforce and that was about essentially leadership of the healthcare science workforce, which would be from the, the chief healthcare science officer. And that would be mirroring my responsibility for, for nurses within Scotland. Then healthcare science is a broad church of professional groupings within the NHS. So laboratory workers, cardiac physiologists, audiologists, and they would provide leadership and policy development on that. And they operationally reported into me as a director. The healthcare associated infection policy and antimicrobial resistance was a, a policy area within my directorate. It, it didn't necessarily have to be within the CNO's directorate. It could have been one of the pieces of policy that was taken by a number of, of directors. But it, it sat with the, the CNO, I think, particularly since Lord Maclean's public inquiry into the Vale of Leven, when it, it was recognised that uh, nurses and midwives have a big responsibility in preventing hospital-acquired infection. So in 2016, for instance, we, we published a, a strategy. The government published a strategy on antimicrobial resistance and healthcare-associated infection that was lasting until 2021 that had a number of key components in it where we developed policy and that then would be articulated into day-to-day -day practice. Okay. Um, and you said there that this was a, um, an area of work which could have been in other directorates but happened to be located in yours. Um, does that reflect the fact that it goes beyond the realm of nursing and into other parts of the health service? Indeed, antimicrobial resistance is part of that. And although there's an increasing number of nurse prescribers, the bulk of, of prescriptions are, are written by, by medical staff, there are cleaning standards, there's the, the health environment inspection, and there's day-to-day -day clinical practice for everybody who deli who's delivering clinical care. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it, it does go wider. But there's a predominant, um, I think, role and responsibility for nurses for in this area. Yeah, OK. Now, I, I think you'll probably be aware, something of interest to the inquiry is the interaction between building engineering services such as ventilation and water and so on and infection control. Um, and so there are obviously there are engineering elements to that and infection control elements to it. Um, when you were the chief nursing officer, to what extent was the role of building engineering services in infection control something that was on the radar screen of your director? The building engineering services and hard facilities management services would, the leadership of that was through the 
Christine McLaughlin and, and, and Alan Morrison within, within government and, and exercised through Health Facilities Scotland and Health Protection Scotland, or Health Facilities Scotland in particular. But um, Health Facilities Scotland and Health Protection Scotland had a close working relationship within National Services Scotland. It didn't feature hugely at that time because there were standards. Health Facilities Scotland dealt with that. And if it were determined a need to be involved in the, the HEI AMR strategy, as we would call it, we would have done that. But it, at that time, there didn't appear to be a need because there were exact, extant standards. So whether there were issues around water and ventilation, needing an authorising engineer for that, there were standards that Health Facility Scotland issued uh, guidance on, then that was taken care of there. And it tended to be more of the either soft FM or operational clinical practices that were involved in that at that time. Okay, so I think as I've understood it, you've described there um, the responsibility for the, the the policy, I suppose, or the, the the guidelines in relation to the engineering systems sitting within Health Facilities Scotland. Um, and you mentioned Alan Morrison and Christine McLaughlin; they were certainly Mr Morrison still is, I think, um, officials within the, the, the finance part of the, the healthcare director. Is that correct? Yes, and, and similar to the CNO's responsibilities being wider than nursing, I think the finance director's facilities are, uh, responsibilities would also be wider than finance. Mm -hmm. And in, insofar as engineering issues were, were being considered in the level of the, the Scottish government, does that reflect the fact that if you're installing a, uh, an engineering system, it tends to be a, a, an item of capital expenditure or money's being spent on it? Is, it, is, that, is that why it found its home there? So I, I don't know, but I'd rather suspect so. Yeah. And just going slightly beyond that, <clears throat> not necessarily in relation to matters of detailed engineering, but on things like the the output parameters of building services that bear directly on the, the care of patients. I have in mind things like air changes um, produced by a ventilation system or pressure gradients generated by a ventilation system. But to what extent was that kind of thing um, on your radar screen insofar as it um, there might be a need for training or knowledge amongst uh, healthcare staff? So we did have a section within the, the strategy and certainly in our day-to-day -day policy work, there would be ongoing dialogue about were there any inhibitors of good and effective infection control procedures. There was an assumption that that would be taken through Health Facilities Scotland. Now, within my policy area, when I was CNO, there were some areas that were arising out of the Queen Elizabeth that I think took our focus round about slightly more widely than the traditional clinical staff and clinical guidance when Healthcare Improvement Scotland did an environment inspection within the Queen Elizabeth. It, it signalled um, cleaning of the ventilation grills, but also the, the health environment inspectorate that HII, HIS have also at times would, would signal areas there and that would be dealt with at that time on a one-to-one -one basis, on a single issue basis. Mm -hmm. So we've, the inquiry has heard all about SHTM 0301 and the parameters that it recommends as, as outputs for ventilation systems in different clinical environments. Uh, was there an expectation um, at the time that you were the chief nursing officer that uh, healthcare staff responsible for the care of patients we'd have a knowledge about things like air change rates or pressure gradients? Day-to-day -day healthcare staff, I, I would not have expected. So the traditional ward sister or, or senior charge nurse, I would not have expected to know whether or not there were six year changes, two year changes or 10 year changes, unless they were working in a more specialist area such as theatres or the burns unit or intensive care areas where there was a requirement for higher level but all I would have expected of the clinicians there was to know that 
the engineering requirements needed to be met. And that was really about access to services. So they would understand the importance of the, the facility staff, the hospital engineers coming in, making sure there was appropriate maintenance and, and ongoing upkeep rather than them having a detailed knowledge. I would have expected the hospital engineering staff to know very detailed um, information about what was required to keep the hospital in a fit and proper state. Mm -hmm. and, and that knowledge of output parameters, and I, I accept what you're saying, that there's a limit to what you would expect from the, the clinical staff. Um, was that, or did it ever become a formal part of their training, or was it something that they would be expected to learn on the job? I don't think it would be part of people's training, although at the, I understand at the moment National Education Scotland is looking at a knowledge and skills framework for the built environment, which I suspect will bring in early introductory information at, at the early stages right through to the more expert specialist knowledge that we would require of infection control practitioners and, and hospital engineers. So I don't think it would be part of the training. I don't think that would be necessary. But I think an element of an understanding of it. So when you say on the job, I feel that's too casual. Mm -hmm. I think it would be part of someone's induction and understanding of their managerial responsibilities as a senior charge nurse of understanding the environment within which they worked, the environment within which they delivered care. And that would be part of an induction programme of people moving into that area to work. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> now, moving from the generalities to the, the specifics, the, the issue with... The, the ventilation in the critical care department at the, the RHCYP came to prominence in July 2019. Uh, and I think you say in your statement that you were on leave of absence at, at that particular time and came back to work in August of 2019. And so by that time, much of what might, one might call the initial emergency response had already happened. So in other words, the Cabinet Secretary had decided already to postpone the opening uh, and the Oversight Board had already been set up. Is that right? Those things had happened by the time you came back? Completely. Yep. Done and dusted. Yeah. Um, and on your, on your return, you, you became a member of that board, the Oversight Board. And I think you say that you became its chair from 2019, or October 2019. Um, and... You cover in your statement the, the fact that the Oversight Board was set up following the escalation of NHS Lothian to Stage 3 on the Scottish Government's Support and Intervention Framework. Is that right? Yes. Okay. If we just have a look at the terms of reference for the Oversight Board, these are at uh, Bundle 7, Volume 2, uh, page 354. Um, in fact, if we just go back to 353, uh, you see there terms of reference, and it's actually marked as a draft, uh, the author Christine McLaughlin, the approver Malcolm Wright. And then if we go over the page to 354, if you just read from, from what it says under the heading of background, Following a decision to halt the planned move to the new hospital facilities on 9th July, an oversight board is being established to provide advice to ministers on the readiness of the facility to open and on the migration of services to the new facility. Uh, so do you understand from that that the, the oversight board was essentially an assurance mechanism for the government? In, indeed, I think an insurance mechanism for the government, but also an insurance mechanism for NHS Lothian to provide them with the appropriate support. Okay, so did you see it working both ways, essentially? For sure. Yeah. Um, and if we read on uh, to the fourth paragraph, work has been initiated to identify the solution needed to ensure the ventilation in the critical care unit in the new site meets the required clinical and safety standards. Uh, and the Scottish Government has commissioned NHS National Services Scotland to undertake a detailed assessment of all building systems in the new hospital, which could impact safe operation for patients and staff, uh, and so on. So do we see there that there were 
broadly two elements to the work. First of all, uh, the issue of a solution to the critical care ventilation issue itself, but more broadly than that, uh, a wider assessment of the hospital's compliance with guidance. Yes. Uh, and then reading on, it says this work will be phased with assessment of water ventilation and drainage systems prioritised, including the proposed fix for the ventilation unit. And do you know why it was phased in that particular way? Risk. So the other aspects, medical gases, fire and electricals, would have appeared less um, critical. But learning from the Queen Elizabeth, you don't know what you don't know. So I think given that there had been a problem identified, it was determined important to take a more comprehensive look to check and test that everything was in order that it should be. And therefore, it would have been certainly ventilation based on the, the fact that they weren't meeting standards, water based on what we knew about the Queen Elizabeth and drains similarly. OK, thank you. And then uh, just the final paragraph in that box. In order to provide coordinated advice to ministers, an oversight board is being established, which will seek assurance from NHS Lothian that according to its due diligence and governance, the facility is ready to open, and from NHS NSS that its agreed diligence has been successfully completed. Um, and so there's reference there to NHS Lothian and to NHS NSS. Were those really the two sources of information that the Oversight Board had for its decision making? Yes, NSS contained Health Facilities Scotland and at that time Health Protection Scotland, soon to become NHS RHI, and they were the expert groups within, available to NHS Scotland. So that was important that they were involved. Yeah. And then if we look at the scope of work, uh, there's a list of bullet points about the, the things that the Oversight Board are going to do. So advice on phased occupation, advice on the proposed solution for ventilation and critical care and other areas that require rectification, um, advice on facility and operational readiness to migrate and so on. And down at the bottom, we see their identification of areas that could be done differently in the future. Now we're sort of slightly jumping ahead to the end, but do, just while we're here, do, do you recall if that was something that the Oversight Board did or, or was that not done? I think it could have been done more comprehensively had we not had COVID. The, we did it on an ongoing basis. So again, there is absolutely no point in, in having such a, a critical piece of work in terms of overseeing the safety of a capital programme for the health service if we were going to wait till the end to learn. So I think there was ongoing learning. And as HFS and HPS and NSS were in the room, then that ongoing learning was, was taken away. I, I don't have it in front of me, but my understanding is that the last meeting of the Oversight Board uh, had a summary of, of the issues that had been dealt with. I think we didn't publish a, a, a report as such from the Oversight Board. And I don't know that, that it was ever intended to, to do that, but on reflection, a, a final report may have been helpful. But with COVID coming in and the intense pressure that the, the key people who were involved were under in terms of giving professional advice and support, I think we felt it, it wasn't appropriate to, to do that. OK. And if we look over the page at the, the membership of the Oversight Board, we can all see the, the list of, of people, um, but it includes the Chief Finance Officer, Chief Medical Officer, Chief Nursing Officer um, of the Scottish Government, um, officials from NHS Lothian, Scottish Futures Trust, NHS, uh, NSS, uh, and so on. Fair to describe this as, as quite a high-powered body in terms of its seniority. I think it, it was a body that was appropriate given the level of advice that was needed for the Cabinet Secretary. Um, and just to expand on, on that. I, I, I think given we had a, one of our big NHS boards with a, a project that appeared not to meet standards, 
that there needed to be a confidence around that board table of challenge and giving advice, it, it was deemed appropriate that it would be that senior level who, who would be around the table. Okay. And given the, the seniority of the people that, that, that were there, um, and just having regard to the answer you gave a moment ago about no, no production of a formal report of learning, um, was, was there a sense in which all of these officials were able to learn on an ongoing basis and, and take lessons back in that sense? Was that something that was underway? For sure, as it was, and, and individuals did take that forwards. I also finished my employment in, in April 2023, so uh, 2021, so I can't speak for, for subsequent learning that, that may have taken in a more formal fashion, but one would certainly have expected the, the people who were around the table to, to take things forwards and, and weave them into day-to-day -day practice or initiate programmes of change. Okay. Was that, was that something that you yourself were able to do through your membership of the, the Oversight Board? Constantly. I think the whole issue of learning and improvement was something that is fundamental to healthcare provision. And within my policy team, they were constantly in back and forwards with NHS boards, whether it was to talk about outbreaks or whether it was to talk about learning or people would look for advice for them. Uh, I did host in June a 2019 certainly learning from the Queen Elizabeth in terms of moving that forwards but I think given the the issue of, of COVID that came in um, in, the, in the latter part of the oversight board work it was difficult to have more formal learning uh, in a comprehensive way but I'm confident that would have been taken on um, by my successors. Okay now you, you explain in your statement that um, shortly after your arrival on the oversight board NHS Lothian was escalated to level four on the, the escalation framework. And uh, we know that one of the, the key consequences of that was the appointment of Mary Morgan as the senior programme director. Um, what was the scope of uh, Ms Morgan's role? So she was expected to, to manage the whole programme and have, in my mind, full roaming rights ac across the programme. She developed a, a planned programme of work and... She was involved in making sure that the project milestones were, were reached and she was particularly skillful at finding solutions to problems that may have arisen in terms of being an intermediary or identifying and, and bringing together the people who could resolve that problem. Mm -hmm. But she essentially reported on the, the outcome of the programme, made sure that the programme milestones were met and if they weren't met, there was a cogent reason given, an explanation and a, a an adjustment to the plan was put in place. Okay. And when you refer to her having responsibility for the whole programme, do you mean by that the, the two things that we looked at before? So the, the, the solution to the critical care ventilation, but also more widely than that, um, ensuring that the rest of the hospital was brought up uh, to the requirements of the guidance? Yes, because within... NSS's report, there were other areas that, that were identified that needed to be corrected. And indeed, the Lochranza, in terms of hemato-oncology, also needed um, a change. But that was probably more based on anticipated needs of future patients rather than necessarily inappropriate scoping. Mm -hmm. OK, so we have all that additional work that the health board's got to cope with. Um, is, it, is it fair to say to see that the appointment of Mary Morgan as the provision of additional management resource to the health board to help get all of that work done in short? Or was there another element to her role? I, th I think she had two faces to her role. So she, her role, I would see, would be helpful to NHS Lothian because it was an additional resource and it was gave an external perspective, so not someone who hadn't been steeped in the whole programme and gave fresh eyes. It was someone with programme management skills who could help lift herself out of the day-to-day -day contract negotiations, managing people, and she could take a perspective. 
She also gave confidence to myself as chair of the oversight board, cabinet secretary, but I think confidence to the oversight board that work was being kept on track and there was an on-balance reasonableness if things were, were falling behind or things needed to be challenged. Mm. I think she was a very helpful person, but that role was important to give additional support and oversight to NHS Lothian, but also to give additional assurance to myself as Oversight Board Chair, but also the Director General and the Cabinet Secretary that work was on track. Okay. Now, you, um, you say in your statement that the most intense period of activity for the Oversight Board was from your arrival in August 2019 through to the end of October 2019. Now, what was it that made that particular period uh, particularly intense? I think it was making sure that everything had been assessed appropriately, that there was a reasonable planned programme of work, and then which could then be put in place. And once that was once it was agreed what was needed to be done and taken forwards, then having the planned programme of work and making sure it carried forward, there was less formal decisions that needed to be taken and perhaps less in the way of discussion about what should and what shouldn't be done. OK, so the, the, the intensity came from, in short, trying to work out what needed to be done. Yes. And then after that, it was a case of making sure it was done. Because when the host, when the decision, although I, I was off on sick leave, when the, the decision to stop the, the occupation of the hospital, it wasn't done thinking, we'll... we'll delay the move for two years. It, it was done thinking, we'll, we'll delay the, the, the move hopefully for a few weeks or a month or two to determine whether what, what additional work needed to be done. I don't think it was expected that there would be such a comprehensive programme of work in that. So it was important the clinicians and all of the staff had had their rosters made up. Some new staff had been recruited based on where they would be working. Childcare arrangements had been made and all of that needed to be unmade for, for staff. And patients were looking forward to improved facilities. Therefore, I think it was reasonable that as much urgency could be put into determining what was going to happen so that we knew how long we would need to take. And clearly COVID got in the way of that. But it was important that we, we did all of that work so that we could determine what needed to be done and how it was going to be done. Okay. Now, on the critical care ventilation itself, uh, the remedial works which were instructed uh, were for the achievement of 10 air changes per hour and um, 10 pascals of positive pressure. Was the choice of those particular parameters something that was discussed by the Oversight Board at all? That would have been out with our, our area of expertise. The choice of meeting standards, I think, was that of Health Facilities Scotland, Health Protection Scotland. So looking at the guidance, I think also working closely with the senior infection control doctor and senior infection control nurse of NHS Lothian to make sure that everyone was satisfied that the standards that were coming and going to be put in place were there. And once we were, the Oversight Board was satisfied that those agencies, so HFS, HPS, and internally the Infection Prevention Control Team were satisfied, then we were satisfied. Okay. Um, so just to be clear about it, the choice of these parameters was being discussed and decided upon by, by others outside of the, the Oversight Board? By experts. Over outside, uh, well, also coming in attendance to the oversight board in terms of HPS and HFS, because there are national uh, bodies that are exist to provide professional expertise and guidance, mm -hmm. and therefore it was appropriate that we took that expertise and guidance. Okay. Um, and if we go, please, to bundle thirteen, volume four, at page seven hundred and four. Um, you should, I hope, see in front of you there, uh, Ms. McQueen, the, the minutes of the Oversight Board on the 22nd of August 2019. Do you see that? 22nd of August, yes. 22nd of August 2019. And I think, I think this, you're, you're marked as present. I think this is probably your first Oversight Board meeting. Um, 
And if we just look down to uh, 4.2, let me just check, 4.2.5, please. We see there recorded, the Oversight Board agreed that it was now content with the critical care specification and that it clearly outlined the areas within which the building, within the build, outlined which areas within the building this agreement applied to. So we see there quite quite early on in the life of the Oversight Board, the um, the specification for the critical care ventilation uh, was was accepted. And was was that a reference to the the ten air changes and uh, ten pascals of positive pressure? Yes. And that was the critical care specifications explicitly. Okay. And then if we go down to 4.2.7, um, what it says there is that it was noted from discussion last week, it was very clear that it would not be possible to secure a fast track technical design unless NHS Lothian agreed to waive the right of a legal challenge for the current design of the critical care system. This was coming from Multiplex, not IHSL. So is it is it fair to say that insofar as there were obstacles to progress, it wasn't the choice of the technical solution, but rather the commercial implications of it? Yes. Now, we, we understand from, from other evidence that the choice of those particular parameters of 10 air changes per hour and uh, 10 pascals of pressure was perhaps not entirely straightforward. Um, the, the designers, as, as you may know, held the view then and continue to hold it now that the, the critical care ventilation that they designed at four air changes per hour and with balance pressure was compliant with guidance. Um, were you aware of that when you were on the oversight board? I was aware that there was a mixed view of what was appropriate. And I, I was aware that the designers and builders believed that they had designed and built a hospital that was both meeting the standards and in particular was that specified by NHS Lothian. However, I think when you build a hospital or have a big refurbishment, but in this case building a hospital, what you have to do is have a strategic intent about what the building is going to be used for. So the building was going to be used for our very sickest children in the east of Scotland. From a life cycle point of view, we would hope it would be in existence for 25 years. Or if you look at the current or the previous sick kids, even longer. Mm. And therefore, it's important to understand if we look at the, the technological advances that have happened that mean clinicians can treat uh, very sick as children in a way that perhaps 10 years ago we would never have dreamed of. I believe we have to have the most up-to-date, on balance, best guidance you can have put into your hospital without worrying about profit, without worrying about whether or not there is a, a lower level that one could argue if one wanted to meets the guidance. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, it's helpful to have that, that, that evidence. Um, was that something that was in your mind at the time or was, it, was the Oversight Board just proceeding on the basis that it was going to be 10, 10 and 10 and so let's get on with it? In, in my mind was that was the best guidance available and yep. whilst there may have been arguments to, to have a lesser option, then I, I I didn't understand why we would not want to have the very best we could for the safety of patients and for staff as well. Mm -hmm. We understand that there, there may have been some debate or at least concern at one point amongst the critical care clinicians about the suitability of a positive pressure arrangement for their clinical needs. Is that, is that something that you were aware of? At the time? I think um, Alex McMahon and Tracy Gillis both kept us up, to, uh, they both kept the Oversight Board up to date with, with clinicians' views. I can't remember if that was an explicit uh, concern that was expressed, but that I think is why it was so important that 
the lead infection control doctor and the lead infection control nurse who on a not quite day-to-day -day basis but on a regular basis would interact with such clinicians so that they could take that overall consideration uh, to the discussions that the, we were having or HFS, HPS, the, ex the executives, executive steering group were having about what standards we should have. And I think it's important to remember and understand the strategic intent of the building and it can't always be built for one particular reason. There has to be a, a, a broader perspective taken on it. But it was that's why it was important to have ICN, ICD, infection control nurse and doctor and contributing alongside HFS and HPS alongside the executive at the executive steering group who could then advise mm -hmm. the oversight board. Yeah. At a particular stage in, you know, previously to the agreement of settlement agreement one, the, there had been risk assessments involving the clinicians, the, the critical care clinicians, um, the result of which was a decision that a, a balanced or negative pressure arrangement was very important for their clinical needs. Um, but the guidance requires or recommends a positive pressure arrangement in critical care uh, was was that a debate which was uh, had at the level of the oversight board or or had the the decision about the best way to proceed been taken elsewhere the advice about the best way to proceed would have been taken elsewhere but what i as chair of the oversight board required was an understanding that there had been full support for any decision that was taken that was given to the oversight board so i would not have expected a recommendation come to the oversight board that had a split view Okay. If we go please to uh, bundle 13, volume 4, page 711. Um, which is the minutes of the Oversight Board uh, on the 29th of August 2019. We can see that you were present by telephone on that occasion. And if we go please to page 713, um, and what it, what it says here at, under the heading of ventilation specific points, it says <clears throat> literature review now complete demonstrated limited and suboptimal evidence around air changes and clinical outcomes. Most evidence had been expert opinion, modelling and outbreak reports. Um, and then just reading on down at paragraph four, it says air changes is not a specific hurdle to get over, but is the level generally found to be suitable in the majority of developed countries. And five, buildings over the last few years are much more airtight than they used to be. Four or six air changes per hour is not a lot of ventilation versus an old style leaky building. Air changes are covered by guidance, not standards. Um, and then, uh, and so on. Was, was this a discussion around the question of whether there should be four or six air changes in, in the general wards rather than in the um, specialist areas like critical care? I don't remember the detail of that discussion, but by looking at the notes, I, th I think it was. Okay. And the first point there is, and I think this has its origins in the, the NSS report, that there was limited and suboptimal evidence around air changes and clinical outcomes. Uh, was that something that was the subject of, of discussion before the Oversight Board or, or not? I think I would go back to my point about what the, the guidance says. And it is a higher level because it's clearly it's more expensive, the air handling units are, are more complex, they require uh, more up, upkeep. And therefore, the argument, I don't understand why there would be an argument to have less air changes than what was being recommended so that we could have the safest possible environment for our patients. Mm. So I think anything was about either justifying why there had been a lower level put in 
or exploring, if you could keep that lower level in, it would be less costly and also entrance to the hospital, which I think would not be an unreasonable desire, would have been quicker rather than having to do a, a complete um, reorder of new air handling units. Okay. Um, then if you go please to page 716 in that bundle um, this is the minute of the oversight board 5th of September 2019 and then item 2.1 there's a heading haematology oncology requirements key points Paragraph number one, opportunity now being taken to bring all 12 single rooms, in addition to the five isolation, up to the required standard for neutropenic patients. And at point three, scope of work is similar to that undertaken with the critical care board change. Um, what, what was your understanding of the, of the issue there and the, the decisions taken upon it? So learning from the Queen Elizabeth, where there had been concern about um, outbreaks had been concerned about the environment that the, the children were being, being cared in. I think you'll see, I think it was probably three minutes ago, uh, you, you drew me to, I think, 4.2.5, but I noticed that 4.2.4 was where uh, I first had raised the issue about hemato-oncology and mm. what air changes did we have there. So the issue was about, and there's always a risk when you stop a building programme, that everyone wants to get their improvements in, mm -hmm. which can be more costly and can take a long time. So you do have to guard against it and have a very firm change programme in place. However, I did take the opportunity to ask about hemato-oncology. The executive team took that away and had a reflection and a discussion on it. And given what I'd said about this building was going to be in place for at least 25 years, an opportunity to... I think, increase the specification so that every room would, would be at that. It, it would give more flexibility for individual patients, but it would also mean if there were changes in technology and medicine that there, we may see a different client group who needed a, a, a different environment to work in. So th there were a number of times when we, we said, on balance, we're going to stop anyway. Will we add this in? And sometimes it was no, and sometimes it was yes. And in this case, it was yes. We believed it was right for the hemato-oncology ward to have a, an, an increase in specification. Mm -hmm. And was that seen as, a, as an improvement to the hospital rather than a piece of remedial work in the way that the critical care department was seen? That's exactly what it was. There were a number of areas where there was improvements that we, we took the opportunity to do, which I've already said, sometimes is a risk, but that that was not about poor specification or or poor billing. I mean, there's there's a trying to do this from memory, so I hope I hope I'm correct. But there is a line in the the table of guidance at the back of SHTM 0301, and it deals with I think it's neutropenic areas or something like yes. that, and it recommends the ten air changes and and ten pascals of pressure. Um, Having regard to the existence of that line in the guidance, why is it that the work to the hemato-oncology department was regarded as an improvement rather than a piece of remedial work? So from the minute, I couldn't have remembered um, from memory, there were the, the five isolation rooms and one would normally, well, you would isolate a neutropenic patient. NHS Lothian would have made the calculation based on a current patient population with perhaps a slight increase because increasingly there's, there's improvement, improved outcomes for children. We're treating children that we wouldn't have treated before and they have excellent survival rates, but they do need to be nursed in, in isolation. So they would have calculated five, would have been sufficient. And I don't think the oversight board, and I certainly wasn't saying I, I thought five was insufficient. It was more, given the Queen Elizabeth were going to improve and upgrade their whole unit to that, would it not be helpful 
for future proofing the building and providing the safest possible environment for our, our children that we upgraded that. The executive took that away. They had a discussion. They must have looked at numbers and had a, an additional reflection and decided that they would upgrade the whole unit. Okay. So, in, in short, an improvement based upon extra information or perhaps renewed thinking that wouldn't have been available to the, uh, the NHS people at the time the, the different specification was chosen. Indeed, one could say it was opportunistic, but I think also based on learning from the Queen Elizabeth, it, it was thought to be an appropriate way forwards. Yeah. Um, All right, just bear with me, Mrs. McQueen. Yeah, if you go please to uh, page 759 in that bundle, which is the Oversight Board Minute for the 5th of December 2019. And if we go over the page to item 5, and we see there high value change 107, ventilation works to paediatric critical care and haematology oncology. The Oversight Board approved the high value change combining the paediatric critical care and haematology oncology ventilation works into a single high value change uh, and so on. Then it reads, it was noted that the first technical workshop in relation to this work would be held on Tuesday, the 10th of December, 2019. And that reference there to a technical workshop, was that, was that for the development of the detailed design to achieve the desired output parameters? So there were technical workshops, I think, for two reasons. One, where people actually couldn't agree. And I wasn't prepared to compromise. I needed to make sure and be assured that everyone involved, certainly from the infection control team in Lothian and HPS and HFS, were satisfied that they were recommending to the Oversight Board. What they were recommending to the Oversight Board was appropriate and safe. At times, yes, there, there may have been, and so that would be one reason. And then the other reason would be looking at the technical specification where the, you have choices with, with hair handling units. You have choices about um, refurb not refurbishment, about ongoing maintenance. You have choices about how things will, will work. And that would have likely have been that rather than uh, trying to find an agreed solution. Okay. And then if we just go forward, please, to page 773, which is the Oversight Board Minute for the 29th of January 2020. Um, and if we scroll down at the bottom, we'll see a heading three senior programme directors report. And then over the page, the third bullet reads, noted that engagement to reach final design was key to the ventilation works. Engagement taking place on a weekly basis involving highly technical discussion. Uh, the settlement agreement cannot be completed until the design is signed off. Costs remain to be assessed uh, and so on. The reference there to highly technical discussion, were there challenges in the design? I think when you start from scratch and you have an open piece of land and you're going to build your building, your hospital, then the design that you, you have is optimal for the, if it's a hospital patient needs and for the way the, the building flows and for the M&E services that you have within a hospital. When you're retrofitting, it becomes much more complex because there are interdependencies of systems, whether it's electrical, um, whether it's pressure, and therefore it is not, it's not easy and it's not straightforward. Albeit this was a hospital that hadn't been occupied, it did have existing mechanical and engineering systems and structures in place. So to get something that was appropriate, that was going to be safe, effective, and 
mindful of the public purse, be as cost effective as possible, but also have ease of access for ongoing maintenance and for cleaning, because that is also an issue. I can't recall how this was designed, but if if the engineers can access the air handling units for ongoing maintenance uh, without disturbing patient care, that is ideal. But sometimes the way it's been built means it's straddling, say, two rooms, and that would then mean there'd be two rooms out of place, or the access has to be from within the ward, which, again, causes additional risk. Yeah. So there are many factors. It is so much simpler to, to put in a ventilation system from scratch and from new, rather than have to retrofit that. Yes. So, uh, in other words, technical difficulties, because this was a, a change being made to a building which had already been built. Exactly. Um, if we go forward, please, to page 776, which is the Oversight Board Minute for the 20th of February 2020. Um, and at 2.1, there's a heading about um, ventilation or management requirements for source isolation. And just the, the second round bullet there reads, noted that five isolation rooms in critical care currently supply the correct number of air changes, all from the same air handling unit. Work underway to reduce the dependency of all five rooms on the single air handling unit. Um, what, so far as you can recall, was the, the resolution to that problem? Um. Sorry, sir, I don't remember the resolution to the problem. Okay, that's fine. It's, uh, as we're always keen to say, it's not a memory test, so if, if you don't remember, uh, don't worry. Um, all right. Um, settlement Agreement 2 came to be agreed between NHS Lothian and uh, IHS uh, L, and that was essentially the contractual basis for the, for the remedial works. Um, and you explain in your statement that there were complexities in relation to the, the negotiations around that. Um, and as I read it, you, you explain that there were two categories of complexity. First of all, in the works themselves, and I think we've covered that, the reason for that. Um, but secondly, the existing contractual arrangements in which all of this had to be done. Um, can you explain what your understanding was of the difficulties that arose in that context? The contract negotiations were a matter for NHS Lothian. So we didn't have a huge amount of detail at the oversight board because there was clearly commercial confidence, and the accountability remained with NHS Lothian. I think the difficulties were around responsibility of who should have provided what and who should have said but when I think there were it was a delicate balance the the funders needed to be approached for funding there needed to be as far as possible the guarantee that the contractors would have put in place for m and &E services would continue so there was a risk that if there was a, a particular approach was taken that the the original SPV wouldn't guarantee the work, and that could have been very, very expensive and costly for NHS Lothian. So there was a delicate balance, and I think it sometimes it, it meant issues took longer than we would have wanted, but it, it took the time it, it, it took to get to, to resolution. So it was about making sure the funders were, were still fully involved and wanting to, to provide the funding. It was about securing best value in terms of not having to spend an inordinate amount of public money on, on changes. And it was about making sure that the, the SPV would still hold the, the risk of any ongoing guarantee or maintenance of the, the ME systems that were being put in place. Mm -hmm. is, is there perhaps a parallel here with trying to do works to a building after it's been built that contractually trying to renegotiate things after all these com complicated contracts have been put in place is inevitably going to be a challenge. 
Would that, would that be fair? I think you're right. I think in particular because NHS Lothian had uh, accepted the building and was continue, was paying money every month for the building. I, th I think that's a good way of summarising it. Mm. And in the particular context of an NPD or PFI project, you know, you've got a lot of people involved. So you've got the project company, the building contractor, the designers, the funders, and so on. So, was it your understanding that just trying to get all of these people to agree was a, a challenging thing to do? So it was always going to be challenging. It was complex. And particularly, I, I would have said NHS Lothian were in the back foot because they'd already taken over the building. This, this was a change that we keep moving forwards in the change mechanism. So that was always going to be tricky. Mm -hmm. And you say in your statement that, that you were frustrated that the negotiations were not more straightforward. Um, did you think that there was anything more that could have been done to move that along? No, I, th I think it was what it was. Yeah. And I, I, I believe the NHS Lothian team worked as hard as they possibly could to try and find a resolution, but they were cognizant of the fact that there were complexities. Yeah. Now, you explain in your statement that migration of services to the, the new hospital uh, and patients to the new hospital took place in phases. Um, in broad overview, what approach did the Oversight Board take to its decisions about the phasing of the migration? There was a desire to have the, the hospital building occupied as soon as possible. For some of the reasons I've alluded to, staff were employed to work at a the, the new site and therefore had extraordinary travel times if they were going to the old sites. Um, Childcare arrangements had been put in place. The The new building was there. It, it was Once it was fit for purpose, it, it was a, a much improved environment for, for people to, to have and NHS loading were coming for it. So there was a desire to have the building occupied as soon as it possibly could be. But making sure that the hospital was as safe as it possibly could be at the same time. Mm -hmm. And we were in the hands of the NHS Lothian executive team. So we talked about moving in phases. And for some services, that was deemed appropriate. But for others, particularly when clinicians were involved in, say, outpatients as well as inpatients, it, it would have meant too much loss of clinical time and therefore would have been inappropriate. For instance, CAMs moving, they were didn't want to, to be housed in, in an isolated building without a lot of other people around. So these things had to, to be taken into account. And for DCN, for instance, once we had COVID, the, the, the burden of work for anaesthetists changed quite significantly. And therefore, that probably hastened the, the move over to the, the Royal Infirmary site so that the anaesthetists could have a more compact area for, for them to work in. But we very much were guide given. I think we all wanted on the oversight board to move in as quickly as possible, as safely as possible. Um, but we were guided by NHS Lothian. We had a member of the Area Partnership Forum as part of the oversight group, who was essentially a staff representative. So we were cognizant of the, the needs of staff as well as patients and, and moving forwards. Okay. Uh, were considerations slightly different for the, the Department of Clinical Neurosciences? So that, it, it wasn't necessarily as straightforward. They were, were an, in an environment where they had water challenges in terms of pseudomonas. The imaging kit... The, 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 sorry, this is at the, the Western at the, General? For the Western site. General, yes, yeah. in terms of the old site, uh, was, was less than ideal, but that's why you, you, you pay a lot of money to, to move into a new hospital when you need to, to change the, the current site. So there were issues with water. There was issues with the imaging kit that they would use. Now, one of the resolutions was to buy a, a new scanner and put that in place, which would reduce the risk of the scanner breaking down. And we did have confidence in the infection prevention control systems and processes in terms of managing the risk with water. 
But through choice, that would have been the first area to move because it, it was the area that needed a new building most out of the, the three, I would say. And then when COVID came, it, it, it slightly changed the, the balance. And just explain how it was that COVID changed the balance. So COVID changed the balance on a number of areas. First of all, infection prevention and control teams, Health Facilities Scotland and Health Protection Scotland were all hands to the pump in terms of providing advice to the service, uh, whether nationally or, or individually. The anaesthetists were, were heavily needed for the general intensive care unit for intensive care patients because of COVID as well. So therefore asking them, they were moving towards the Royal Infirmary in terms of the the work for ventilating COVID patients and at times they would also be needed to for ventilation of the neurosurgery and neurology patients so it was more appropriate that they moved and we took advice from the executive medical director on that moved sooner rather than later where yep. there may have been the I think the, the clinicians may have been more thoughtful about moving without COVID in terms of wanting to take a more measured approach, but actually it, it happened more quickly than we had anticipated because of COVID. Okay, so that's perhaps a rare example of something happening more quickly because of COVID. Indeed. Um, and just uh, everybody here will recall disruptions caused by COVID. Did, did, did COVID also have an impact the other way? Did it... Um, make the, the, the migration or the move to other parts take longer to achieve in any sense? So COVID and Brexit, but COVID, yes, did. Um, hospital buildings were assessed as government as being essential. So work wasn't stopped on, on hospital buildings in terms of the construction, the way we'd done other construction programmes across the country. But we needed to put in social distancing for staff, we need to make sure the workforce, trades workforce were, were kept as safe as they possibly could. Uh, although sometimes that, that just wasn't possible in terms of how, how they work if you needed to have two of the trades workforce working up closely. Mm. There, there was some COVID infections within the, the workforce, unfortunately, uh, which delayed the work. But clearly the safety and well-being of the staff, the, the trade staff, was, was paramount. And it also delayed production of uh, equipment kit so you know, the, that that was that happened so it, it was that that delayed things so supply of, of products was delayed by covid uh, it was delayed by, by having different process work processes for the trades workforce and i think the fact that the infection prevention control workforce were then focused on care delivery probably didn't hold production up because the other things were anyway, but they, they also needed to be diverted to providing advice uh, for the, the patients and staff within the hospitals who, who were being nursed. Now it's, it's maybe just an impressionistic matter, and if, if it's impossible to say, then, then please just say so. But I mean, do, you, do you have a, a feel or an impression for how much of a delay was caused by COVID and Brexit and these sort of supervening events um, compared to what would have been the case without them? I think a number of months. Okay. Um, if we go please to uh, Bundle 13, Volume 4, at page 827. Uh, this is the Oversight Board Minute for the 25th of February 2021. Now, I see from the um, from the list, you're not named, neither in attendance nor in the apologies. Um, which would that have been an oversight? Do you think? Do you recall if you were there or if you if you weren't? I have absolutely no reason why I wouldn't have been there. And if I had been there, I would have put apologies in. So okay. Well, if we if we go over to page eight hundred and twenty eight, we have the summary of the senior program director's report. Uh, at the second bullet, it says, noted that the programme status overall was at green with works at practical completion, with all internal building works complete. Uh, then reading down below, noted that all construction validation had been submitted and there remained some HEPA filters to be fitted and tested in main single rooms, not in Loch Ranza ward or critical care as these others had passed. The final IOM report was now awaited 
as this was the critical piece that was required to allow infection prevention and control to sign off iScribe 4 and would then allow the independent tester to certify the final works so that the final service moves to the new hospital could take place. The Oversight Board noted that the draft IOM report was expected by the end of this week and the final report would then be completed over the next week. From the data submitted and shared, there were no indications to expect any serious concerns being raised in the IOM report that would impact on uh, final sign-off. Um, and then just right down at the bottom of the page, uh, we have the word the, and then if we go over the page, uh, the IOM report remained the important piece that was missing to allow independent test or sign off. Now, all of those documents that are referred to there as being needed for sign off, will all, were, were all of those in due course received? Yes. And then if we go down to page 829, please. Um, if we scroll down to the second last paragraph. It reads there, Ms Morgan outlined that the last year had been spent correcting the pressure cascade in the new hospital. In that period, the critical care and Loch Ranza ward ventilation systems had been rebuilt. CAMs had been stripped out and reopened, uh, and all other items in the HFS report had been addressed. The new hospital was now one of the safest and best buildings in the whole of Scotland. To delay the final service moves further, when no issues relating to the ventilation piece had been identified, would be very risk averse. Now, Ms Morgan's uh, description there of the building, to, to what extent was that view accepted and shared by the Oversight Board? So once people enter a hospital, then you add additional risk. And that's why you have to have good risk management systems. In this case, if we're talking about, it's wider than that, but infection prevention and control, good um, infection prevention and control procedures, including surveillance, so that you you no one understand what's happening within the hospital. I think it was, on ho on the whole, accepted. We had been thorough. The hospital had been inspected many times. We had specified the the level up, up to the level of the guidance, and therefore we believed that it, it was one of the safest and best buildings in the whole of Scotland, given its newness and its completeness. Mm. Um. If we could go, please, to your witness statement. So that's uh, witness statement bundle one at page 142. It's paragraph 53 of your statement. And you're, you're setting out here uh, your reflections on the project. Um, and just picking up from the second sentence, uh, you say, on reflection, I consider there could have been a sharper focus from NHSL to move forwards and to find solutions. It's easy with hindsight to say this because they were, of course, accountable for what had happened. There was an element of thoughtfulness from NHSL in that they had made a mistake already and therefore considered how they were going to make sure they could get the best possible solution out of this. When the new chief executive and chair were appointed, processes improved and pace increased. Uh, could I ask you, what do you mean when you say that there was an element of thoughtfulness from NHSL? I think, understandably, NHS Lothian were not wanting to make further mistakes. And although the Oversight Board was there to, to support and I think therefore take some of the responsibility from NHS Lothian, the reality is NHS Lothian were needing to make that decision and they were accountable. So the level of accountability from the Chief Executive to the Board was in place. So I think any hesitation and, and anxiety about risk was based reasonably on the fact that already there had been a delay in the hospital, already there had been money paid, and already there had been arguably substandard work put in, in place. And therefore, there, it was, there was a keenness to make sure that we moved forwards and we got this right. But I think it was probably an inevitable wounding of, of the team because they, they recognised there had been mistakes and they recognised they wanted very much to move forwards. Okay. So it sounds from what you're saying that this was a, a sort of well-motivated attitude, in other words, trying to do the best. There was no recalcitrance. It was absolutely wanting to do the best 
and and working towards getting that very safe environment for patients and it, that that's what it was it was i think human factors and, and human nature of anxiety based on previous anxieties based on previous mistakes making sure we weren't going to do that going forward so um And you you explain that the process has improved and the pace increased when the new mm -hmm. chair and chief executive were appointed. When was that? In quite near the end. I can't remember. I'm sorry. It was quite near the end. Okay, perhaps sort of mid two thousand, something like that, or or later than that, perhaps. Maybe the autumn, but I I, I couldn't say. Apologies. And. It, can I just check what you mean? Do, do you mean that the new chair and chief executive caused that improvement, or was it simply that they that their arrival coincided with the time when things got better? So I don't know, but you, you'll note from the the, the the last minute you of the meeting that the chief executive was present. I know that the chair uh, the chair actively sought me out to meet with me so that they could make sure that they were doing everything they possibly could. So whether it was coincidence or whether it was a sharper focus and they were paying attention to it and and didn't and they embraced the government support, I think, rather than resented it. Was there a sense that the, the government support had been resented under the, the previous office holders? I think it's so I don't know, but I think it's it's always difficult. Nobody really likes to be escalated in any part of the framework, in particular not to level four. And nobody really likes having an oversight board within within their system. So the new chief executive and chair were new, coming with fresh eyes, and they just wanted to help get the job done. Okay, I mean, is, is it possible that by the time they arrived, all the all the difficult choices and the heavy lifting had been done? Very much so, and it may well have happened without their arrival. Um, and in your statement, you say that um, the Scottish government's intervention, so escalation, appointment of the oversight board and the appointment of Mary Morgan, in your view, all of those steps were necessary. Is that is that right? Yes, because as we've already talked about the anxieties that NHS Lothian had, so there was something about providing assurance to the Cabinet Secretary and to the Director General that appropriate decisions would be taken uh, that were measured and that were time bound, uh, ideally, and that it would be to the appropriate standard. And therefore, having that focus, having that you know, ability to bring in the external support and making sure there was the attention spent on it, I believe was appropriate and supported NHS Lothian to get to the position they were in. Yeah. Is there a case for saying that health boards doing major building projects should be given additional resource, not perhaps of the sort of um, scale and seniority of the, the membership of the oversight board, um, but uh, perhaps along the lines of an extra project director like Mary Morgan or something like that, not after things go wrong, but at the outset of big construction projects? NHS boards have choices. And it's for them to determine when they have a capital programme what level of support that they have and to put in place. So they make decisions about the, the programme team, who should be on it, what skills they have and how to take it forwards. And therefore, it, I would expect an NHS board who had a big capital build to have a good programme. They probably did have a programme director, but to have the resources they needed to, to make the programme work. I think NSS Assure will, will, be, will be helpful as well in terms of reminding boards of the standards that are required and making sure if, if there is any derogation that it is wholly appropriate rather than um, through personal choice. And you mentioned uh, NHS Assure there. Um, fr from your perspective of your know, having held the office of a, a senior official in the, the government and from working on this oversight board, do you think that the, the NHS Assure solution is, is the right one and is enough? Or are there other things that you think can and should be done differently for health boards 
building major hospitals. So I'm old enough to remember the Common Services Agency Building Services Division, and that was very helpful in terms of having an expertise grouped uh, in one area and who would be overseeing what was happening across Scotland. They were there for advice, they were there for our guidance and an element of assurance in terms of making sure that the programmes fitted what was happening. When we had the dialogue about should they be in charge of all capital programmes or should that be left to NHS boards, um, in, in their current form, then in NHS boards have are accountable for what's happening within that programme. And I would imagine, because I've not, not been in position now for some time, that part of the assurance that an NHS board would want to have before they signed off any programme was that NHS Assure uh, was content with the, the programme of work. And similarly, HFS and H um, NHS are high, so that all standards were, were taken into place and there was no opportunity for, for derogation uh, without good reason. So you, are you of the view that responsibility for projects of that nature should still remain with the health boards themselves? Yes, but it is a challenge, for, particularly for, for not just big, it's very small health boards. In big health boards, capital programmes do not come around frequently, although there's perhaps more big refurbishments than, than there are of, of new build. So I think you have to have the balance. And health systems are, are regularly used to applying guidance that's not within their piece. So clinicians, for instance, will, will use sign guidelines or NICE guidelines or, or Royal College guidelines because it's best practice. Um, they don't have to be um, instructed to do it. The, the, there's not the, the regulation. So it's entirely possible to have an expert body providing advice. But what I would expect is that NHS boards take them, take that advice, look at what is best practice and apply that to their building programme. Uh, Ms McKean, thank you very much. You've answered all of my questions. Uh, it's possible that Lord Brody or some others will have questions for you. Uh, please stay where you are for the moment. Thank you. Really just... <clears throat> A matter of detail, um, Ms. McQueen. Um, quite early in your evidence, um, you were asked about training of um, infection prevention and control staff in the built environment, you recollect, recollect that. Now, you gave an answer, which is my fault. I just didn't um, a note quickly enough. Um, did you make a reference to a current study or a current program or a current project in relation to that? Or did I pick you up wrongly? No, my lord, you did. I was, I was bold enough to make reference to something that happened uh, more recently rather than within my tenure as CNO uh -huh. and National Education Scotland are currently developing, I understand, uh, a knowledge and skills framework for the built environment for infection control practitioners. Right, and that's National Education Scotland. NHS National Education yeah. Scotland, yes. Well, um, as Mr McClellan indicated, um, we uh, need to give an opportunity to everybody in the room uh, to um, put forward the proposal that there be further questioning. So could I ask you to return to the witness room for perhaps no more than 10 minutes so that Mr. McClellan can check what the position is? Certainly, my lord. Thank you very much, Mr. McClellan. Thank you.
Mr McClellan. Uh, thank you, my Lord. Um, with the input of core participants, there is one further question which I'm content to ask. <clears throat> um, I understand there's one further question that you're going to be asked. Mr McClellan. Thank you, my Lord. Uh, yes, just, just one question. We we discussed earlier on this afternoon uh, the matter of moving uh, NHS Lothian's services to the new site. Um, and in particular, we discussed the matter of the Department of Clinical Neurosciences. Uh, what was your understanding of uh, NHS, uh, NHS Lothian's desire in that regard in relation to the movement of services to, to the, um, the DCN? So my understanding of NHS Lothian would be that they would have wanted to move all the services as quickly um, as possible, and, and DCN would, would have been one of the areas they would have wanted to move sooner rather than later. And, and so far as you were aware, were there any different consider considerations from NHS Lothian's point of view in relation to the, the DCN? By different considerations? Was there a desire to move that uh, particular part of their service uh, stronger or uh, in, in any way different from the other services, so far as you knew? So, 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 far, so far as I knew, because of the issues around the dilapidated state of the building and the, the, the risk with water and, and the risk until we paid for a new scanner to go in, it would have been better for the DCN to, to move sooner rather than later to the new building. And we knew that, but we wanted to as an oversight board to, to take things in, in due course. So it, it, it was known to us that they wanted to, but there was never, as far as I recall, a paper presented to the oversight board that said, we want to move now. And because clearly the executive nurse and medical director were members of, of the oversight board. Mm -hmm. So they weren't just in attendance, they were members of the oversight board. So at any time a paper could have come to, to say that we, we wanted to do that, I think they understood and recognised the, the work that needed to be done and were respectful of that. And obviously the Oversight Board was also respectful of the fact that we wanted to move DCN as, as yep. soon as proper. I don't think any of us wanted to keep DCN in the Western yep. Infirmary. OK. You really have answered all my questions now. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. McQueen. Uh, Thank you, Ms. McQueen. Um, you're now free to go, but uh, before you do go, can I just express my thanks um, for your attendance today, but also the work uh, that's involved in preparing a witness statement. I appreciate that's quite a lot of work, but thank you very much indeed, and you're free to go. Thank you very much indeed, my Lord. Thank you. Um, now, Ms. McClellan, we had hoped to get to Ms Morgan today. I mean, what's your position on that? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, I, I don't have an enormous amount of questioning for Ms Morgan, and um, certainly my own view for what it's worth is that we could uh, get her underway, and depending on how things go, we might even manage to get her finished today, um, if, if your Lordship is content to... Well, well I would, way. yeah, I would be content to follow that um, a uh, plan. So we'll um, certainly begin, Miss Morgan. Good afternoon, Ms Morgan. Now, as you underst uh, understand, you're about to be asked questions by Mr McLennan, who is um, sitti sitting opposite. But first of all, um, I understand you're willing to make an affirmation. Um, yes. Well, just sitting where you are, would you re repeat the words that I'm about to uh, say? I solemnly, sincerely and truly... I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm, declare and affirm that the evidence that I will give 
but the evidence I will give shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you, Miss Morgan. Miss McLennan. Thank you, my lord. Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, could I ask you please just to confirm your name? Uh, my name is Mary Morgan. Uh, and have you provided a witness statement to the inquiry? I have, yes. Could we have on screen, please, uh, Witness Bundle, Volume 1, at page 314? Uh, and I hope you should be able to see in front of you there uh, a witness statement on the screen. Do you see that? Yes, I can. And is that your witness statement? It is, yes. Um, and does that statement set out fully and truthfully your evidence on the matters that it addresses? Uh, yes. And is there anything in it uh, that you think needs to be changed or corrected? Not to my knowledge, no. Now, you are currently the Chief Executive of NHS National Services Scotland, is that correct? Yes. Um, and you were appointed to that post on 1st of April 2021? Yes. And immediately prior to that, and in fact I think the appointments may have overlapped, you served as the, the Senior Programme Director for the, the RHCYP DCN project. Uh, I did. I was the Director of Strategy, Performance and Service Transformation at NSS immediately prior to being appointed as the Chief Executive mm -hmm. of NSS. And I undertook the Senior Programme Director role from within that role. Yes, so you, you, your role as a senior program director was essentially a secondment over yes. from NSS. Yes. And so just to be clear, we, you, you continued to be employed by NSS throughout that yes. appointment. Um, you've set out your qualifications and experience in your statement. Uh, and just by way of summary, you've worked in the NHS in one role or another since 1985. Right? I started as a student nurse employed by the NHS in 1982. In 82? Yes. Okay. Uh, and as you say, originally you worked as a nurse? Yes. Um, and then as you set out in your statement, you moved up through nursing management into general management at regional health boards? Yes. Uh, and then in September 2008, you moved to NHS, NSS as the Director of Health Protection Scotland. Yes. Uh, and you worked there for four years. Yes. Um, and just briefly, what, what's the function of uh, Health Protection Scotland? Um, it is to protect the... the it was really to, to protect the health of the people of Scotland through a variety of six functions to manage outbreaks and incidents, to investigate outbreaks and incidents, and it also had... Um, uh, infection prevention and control team. Okay. Uh, and then from 2012 to 2018, you were the director of the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service. Yes. Uh, and then in 2018, uh, you were appointed as a director, as you say, of strategy performance and service transformation at NSS. That's correct. Uh, and just in broad terms, what was your remit in that role? Um, it was mainly to lead transformation and change programmes um, and I, I was SRO for a number of national programmes, uh, radiology, laboratories um, and the such like and also to um, look after the corporate responsibilities, the corporate role of governance for NSS. Okay and you referred there, I think the phrase you used was transformation and change programmes. Yes. Um, just in broad terms, what does that involve? Um, bringing together um, everybody, all the stakeholders who have an interest in change um, and coming up with the solutions that will meet the needs of the service provision for the people of Scotland or if it's an internal change programme, how we can improve our service delivery and take our staff with us through those programmes. Okay, so, so those are uh, programmes for, for changing the way in which services are delivered? Yes. In, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, and I think you also mentioned that you'd done work in relation to corporate governance at NSS. Yes, that's correct. It was mainly running committee services and ensuring that the board and committees were serviced with um, assurance documents and assurance processes. Okay. As a means of underlying or supporting their decision making? Yes. All right. If we turn then to your appointment as the Senior Programme Director in relation to the, the RHCYP, and you explain in your statement the circumstances of that appointment. Um, and just to put this in context for your evidence, by the time that you were appointed, 
various things had already happened, um, being the cabinet secretary had already decided that the, the opening of the new hospital should be postponed. Is that, is that right? You were appointed after that had yes. happened, yes. Um, and NHS Lothian had been escalated to level three on the Scottish government's performance framework, uh, and the oversight board had been established. Um, and was it the role of the oversight board to, to obtain and provide to the government assurance that uh, the new hospital was, was ready to open? Yes. If we look briefly at your letter of appointment, which is Bundle 13, Volume 3. At page 704. Um, I'm just going to read parts of it. It's dated the 23rd of September 2019. It's from Christine McLaughlin in the Health Finance Directorate. And she says, Dear Mary, thank you for agreeing to accept the role of Senior Programme Director. This appointment forms part of the tailored support to NHS Lothian as part of the escalation to level four of the performance framework for this programme to strengthen the management and assurance arrangements for completing all of the outstanding works necessary to open the facility. Uh, the appointment formally commenced on the 16th of September uh, and so on. Uh, in your role as Senior Programme Director, you will have responsibility for the actions to ensure that the facility is fit for occupation and I expect you to work as part of the NHS Lothian team. All other actions relating to the existing site and to the service migration to the new facility will remain the direct responsibility of NHS Lothian. Um, and was that in fact the way that your role played out in practice after your appointment? Yes. Um, if we look at the letter advising NHS Lothian of your appointment, which is uh, at page 702 in that bundle. Um, I'm just going to read from the first two paragraphs. Following the decision to halt the move to the new hospital, the Cabinet Secretary commissioned two independent reviews, the first by NHS National Services Scotland, to undertake a detailed assessment of all systems in the new hospital that could impact on safe operation for patients and staff, then the second by KPMG. Uh, having reviewed the contents of both reports that were published on Wednesday the 11th of September, I have concluded, on the basis of the scale of the challenge in delivering the Royal Hospital, that NHS Lothian has escalated to level four of our performance framework for this specific project. Um, so, uh, was it your understanding that the government's intervention had been prompted by uh, issues with the critical care ventilation, but that the reports from NSS had identified other matters to be addressed in the interests of patient safety? So when I joined, we were still to receive the first comprehensive and full report um, on three areas being looked at by um, uh, Health Facilities Scotland. Um, although work on drainage and ventilation and water was underway, those final actions were still to be identified. And it was somewhat later that the report into electricity, um, medical gases um, and fire mm -hmm. were received. Mm -hmm. I can't remember today what the time, that time frame that was in, yes. but not all of the, the actions required had been identified at that point in time. OK, um but as, as your role essentially developed, was it, essentially, was it essentially the work identified in those reports once they were finalised and the issue with the critical care ventilation uh, that you were to ensure was carried out? Yes. Um, and then just further down in the, the third paragraph of the letter, picking it up about halfway through, um, it reads, the Oversight Board will continue to take overall responsibility for the completion of the works and opening of the hospital, reporting directly to the Cabinet Secretary. Underneath that board, a senior programme director will be appointed, reporting directly to Scottish Government, and this will be further supported by additional independent technical advice, uh, and so on. The reference there to the senior programme director I take to be a reference to you, uh, but the, what it says there is that the reporting line will be direct to the Scottish Government. But I think, in fact, your, your reporting was done to the Oversight Board. Is that 
Correct. It was, and to Fiona McQueen in in that regard, on a, a, whenever I needed to have contact with Scottish Government, it was Fiona McQueen that I would speak to in that regard. Okay, so as well as your formal reporting line um, to the Oversight Board, and the yeah. inquiry's got your reports about that, you also had access to Fiona McQueen as and when you needed yes. to. Okay. Um, and NHS Lothian still had in place its project team, or at least Correct. members of its project team. Um, and did you did you work with them? Did you become an embedded member of that of that team? Was that was that how it worked? That's correct. Yes, I worked very closely with Brian Curry and the team, and indeed with um, with other members of the team. Um, and my closest liaison in with NHS Lothian was through Susan Goldsmith, although obviously with others, um, and Brian Curry. Mm -hmm. Um, and one can imagine that in some circumstances, arriving as a new member of a team um, that's been in place for a long time might be a challenging thing to do. How did you find the, the transition into the team? It, it, it was, everybody was very professional and very, very welcoming. Um, there was some uncertainty about what I was there to do, what I was going to do, whether I was going to bring about sweeping changes. Um, I had a really good induction um, to the team with Brian Curry. I met, the, met him there uh, on site on a Tuesday. Um, and very quickly, I think we got to know each other. Uh, and, and I worked as part of, part of that team mm. and as part of, I believe, NHS Lothian's executive team. Mm. Not a close part of it, but I t attended the, the executive board meetings and had close contact with them. Mm -hmm. And how did the arrangements work between you and, and Mr Curry? Was, was there a hierarchy arrangement or did you work as a, in sort of partnership or, or how, did that, how did that function? We, we worked together collaboratively to solve the solutions that, that were there. Um, I would ask questions, he would ask questions, he would present solutions, then we would go and explore it further. So we worked very collaboratively and very closely together. There, it, it, there was a question about whether Brian would, continue, would report to me um, or would continue with his existing lines, but I inserted myself in as part of that that team. That's how I felt it was anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and just in, in general terms, over the time that you were there, how did you feel that the, the relationship side of things worked? W with whom? With, between myself and well, well, colleagues? With, or? With, with the NHS Lothian project team. It was very positive. Everybody was very keen to make sure that we made progress, that the work was done. There were some very, very difficult and challenging um, negotiations to be undertaken with IHSL. I would say even that colleague, even colleagues in, in IHSL were keen to progress those, mm -hmm. despite those challenging pieces. So relationships were professional. Sometimes they were commercial. Um, but we all had the same end in mind, and that was really important to maintain. Okay. Now, just returning a little bit to your your own background, you explain that uh, you had worked previously in the procurement of a, a health sector building under the NPD structure. That's correct. Um, which I think, given the, the rarity of that structure, may, probably makes you quite a rare person. But okay. um, th and that was the, the Jack Copeland Centre for the, the Blood Transfusion Service. Yes. Um, was, was that a building which had specialised ventilation systems? Yes. And could you just uh, explain to us what, what they were and what was specialised about them? Well, I mean, I guess an air handling unit is an air handling unit in different sizes. Um, what was special, uh, what is special about the Jack Copeland Centre is that it's a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical grade manufacturing service. It, it manufactures um, ATMPs. Um, uh, and, and for that needs um, very special cascade. Um, so grade A is a, a, a pharmaceutical ventilation clean rooms um, are in cabinets. Grade B um, in environment, grade C uh, in corridors into grade D to where we do our blood manufacturing. Um, and that's a very precise cascade um, that needed to be delivered. So it was highly complex to get that delivered. And when you say cascade, do you mean a cascade of pressure arrangements in the so building? So it needs a cascade of pressure arrangements to make sure that you have um, the right mix of positive pressures to be able to push um, any air contaminants. I mean, these are, are clean room facilities. So any air contaminants need to be pushed out of those environments in which we're manufacturing those very um, highly specialised products. Okay. 
Um, and was that was that an even more sort of technical ventilation setup than the ones you had to deal with on the the RHCYP or? Yes, because the cascades had to operate differently and there were a variety of different rooms. So it was it was a different set of circumstances. But yes, um, it, 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 was, it was highly complex. Some of the team had had some learning previously from an, another set of clean room facilities that had been put in place and recognised that those cascades and the balancing of those um, ha were, were really quite um, difficult. Make sure the, the rooms were all sealed properly. Um, and that increasing the pressure in one area uh, was, was difficult in another area. And one of the big factors in the Jack Copeland Centre was the level of resilience in the air handling units. So these are not things that can be switched on and off without having continuity um, of, of the pressure cascade to make sure that the air is kept completely clean. And that was the precise issue we had a difficulty with, that the, there wasn't sufficient resilience initially in the air handling units that we had put in place and those needed to be upgraded and replaced prior okay. to practical completion. I, I was going to come on to that, but perhaps you could just um, explain that. You, you say in your statement that there was a, a challenge, if I can put it that way, about the, the ventilation systems. And you, you started to explain it there. Could you just outline for us what, what the problem was and, and briefly why it was that it arose? So there was insufficient... I can't recall... Well, there was insufficient... Um, capacity size of motor in the air handling units in the event of failure of one or more of those air handling units. Uh, the motors weren't big enough to pick up and maintain the cascade pressures that were in place. Um, so the motors and air handling units size had to be increased in order that if there was a failure, then the resilience measures would kick into place sufficiently. And, and was that in origin... Uh a briefing issue or a design issue or a, a manufacturing issue or I, I can't recall what it was. It was it was on testing that the motors were found to be insufficiently sized in the event of a, a, a failure of one of the motors. Okay. Uh, and uh, so to what extent did working on that project give you knowledge and experience of things like the, the SHTM guidance on ventilation? Um, I knew where to, to look if I wanted to make a personal reference to something. Um, I knew some of the questions to ask. Um, I had some experience of the challenges that getting um, ventilation pressures um, correctly could, could cause. Okay. Uh, and you've explained in your statement that this project was procured on under an NPD structure. Right. Um, you know, to what extent did, did that project give you knowledge and experience of the of the issues that can arise in a in an NPD uh, contract structure? So I think definitely the commercial nature of that, understanding the pro the, the status of the project agreement. Um, understanding how difficult it was to make changes to anything, especially post-practical completion, and the interplay between um, the constructors and the, the FM company who is going to have to maintain that um, and the, the SPV. Yep. Yes. So it, it, was experience, it was experience of having been through that and some of those challenges and difficulties uh, that I recalled. So when, when you came into the, the RHCYP project, did you already have a, a, either an expectation or an awareness that renegotiating things was going to be a, a challenging process? Yes. And did, did your experience on that project bear that expectation out? Um, yes. Uh, well, wh which project? The, the Jack the, Copeland or no, no, the the RHCYP project. Uh, yes, it was it was highly complex, um, more complex, more complicated, more complex. Many of our negotiations in the Jack Copeland Centre happened prior to practical completion. Um, uh, there were some negotiations that needed to happen after the independent tester at the Jack Copeland Centre had opined um, about whether or not we would accept some of the findings. Uh, that, that were there um, uh, and they were mostly about resilience and the particular nature of having 25% um, uh, uh, flexibility um, uh, left in, in the space 
um, but the negotiations and particularly the impact on payment mechanism um, and the unitary charge whenever we made changes was, was, was difficult. I have to say, I think the negotiations around the Royal Hospital for Sick Children and Young People, DCN, um, were very much more complex uh, than, than, than I had anticipated. OK. And one of the points you made just a moment ago was that the extra complexity comes from trying to do that negotiation after practical completion. Um, can you explain to us what difference the timing makes? Um, Prior to practical completion, one hasn't completed, so um, one hasn't accepted the building. Um, in this instance, the building had been accepted by NHS Lothian, and therefore the unitary charge was being paid. Um, and yeah, I think that makes it makes changes difficult. Okay. <coughs> so. You obviously came into the, the RHCYP project with two important areas of, of, of experience. First of all, in relation to ventilation systems and the relevant guidance, uh, but also in relation to the NPD project structure. Um, to what extent was that knowledge and experience that NHSL itself lacked prior to you joining the team? Um. I don't, I don't believe they lacked the knowledge. I think I augmented it and was somebody, I guess Scottish Government wanted somebody to provide support, additional support to NHS Lothian. Um, and I think I added perhaps experience that somebody else may not have brought into that support role. So had an understanding of what they were going through. So I don't believe it's that they, they lacked it. I think it, it was an addition, it was some, I was somebody who brought an additional knowledge or somebody who had knowledge of what they were going through rather than somebody who didn't. Yeah, okay. You know, probably related to these issues of, of the commercial negotiations we were talking about a moment ago, uh, you say in your statement that relations between NHS Lothian and IHSL were challenging but that you felt that you were able to make a positive difference to that. Uh, could you just explain to us what it was that was challenging about those relations and what it was that you were able to bring to, to help it out? Mm. I think they were very wary of each other. Multiplex in particular, um, I think, wanted off the site. Their work was done. They had a few things that they thought were relatively minor um, to do, um, and then they wanted to get off the site very quickly. Um, Bouige were very concerned that they had expected to have a hospital up and running and it wasn't up and running uh, and there was outstanding work to be done. Um, and NHS Lothian clearly wanted everybody to do what they were, they were there to do. The biggest thing was assumption of responsibility for the hospital not being open. And um, it was very difficult. They, my role wasn't around um, attributing any blame or examining what had happened and what had gone before. And I think a lot of people were looking at what had gone before and what happened before. I was really keen that we looked forward and provided solutions to get the hospital open. Um, and I think that's the, the key piece that I did bring was actually try to lay those things to one side mm -hmm. and actually everybody bring their skills, bring their responsibilities into the room so we can solve the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the, the who's to blame um, piece did get, get in the way of, of relationships. And yeah. the other thing that I did, was not aware of, and I still am not wholly aware of, is what had gone before. I joined the team, so I hadn't seen any of that and wasn't aware of any of that. But there was certainly a, a certainly an, an an air of uh, disquiet, I would say, mm -hmm. in the relationships. Mm -hmm. So, so were those concerns about who was ultimately going to have to pay for all of this? Perhaps were th those sorts of concerns getting in the way of uh, uh, implementing a solution to get the hospital open? Uh, not as broad a sense. It was more of a, it was more of an undercurrent. Um, I think there were particular pieces um, 
although my job was about the, the six areas the HFS wrote the reports on, there were outstanding actions from um, the first supplementary agreement um, and the closure of the hospital that needed to be progressed. Um, so those action plans were subsumed into those into those four areas. Um, and uh, the speed and the pace at which those were getting resolved, I think, were a matter they were a matter of some concern. So having clarity about who was to do what, when they were going to do it, in, uh, and the delivery against that was was critical, I think, just to bringing everybody together. Yeah, OK. Um, you say in your statement that when you arrived, the project team was, was quite depleted due mm -hmm. to retirements or redeployments. Um, and you describe the team as not quite demoralised, but, but muted. The, yeah. the general mood was low. Um, why do you think that was? Because of what they had been through. They had spent, many of them, um, the latter end of their careers. They had been very experienced people who'd come to get this hospital built. And I think they, they took that personally as well as professionally that the hospital had not opened when they'd expected it to. And I felt, I think they felt that they had let people down. And that means their colleagues, their friends, and the patients who were due to be served in that area. And I think that was very hard for those people who were very professional and who dedicated mm -hmm. um, a large portion um, of their lives to a very critical project. Um, and you say that you were particularly reliant when you first came in on Ronnie Henderson, yep. who was NHS Lothian's facilities commissioning manager, um, but that he was overwhelmed with work. Um, in what sense? Was it, was it a problem of volume of work or, or was it something else? He was so critical. He, 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 yeah, I, I don't believe actually that he actually has a, a, a formal engineering qualification, but he knew so much and brought so much knowledge of, of, of guidance and where to find things. So it was really volume of work. Um, I asked for more staff. Um, it took a little bit of time to get those through. Our recruitment process in the health system can be slow. Um, defining what the job roles were going to be was important. But when, when those staff came in, we were then able to divide up who was going to take greater responsibility for water, ventilation, medical gases, electricity, um, and alleviate some of that pressure and reliance on, on Ronnie. Ronnie would, would have been a single point of, of failure um, if, if something had gone, if, if he had been absent for some reason, for example. And the, the issue of the volume of work that was on his shoulders, uh, why had that arisen? Was, was that something which had arisen as a consequence of the issues with the ventilation in critical care being detected, or was it a, a wider problem than that? Um, I, I I can't answer that. Just that I don't know what was there before I arrived. Um, but I knew there was heavy reliance on on Ronnie. I don't know how many people were there supporting him um, prior to that. I was aware that some people had retired and had been moved on to other projects. Um, but I fairly quickly identified that we needed another Ronnie. Another Ronnie, okay. Or um, two. Yeah. Um, and so in, in due course, was that workload issue something that you were able to address? Yes. Um, one of the things that you mentioned in your statement is that the announcement of this public inquiry had an impact on the work that you were trying to do. Um, could you just explain to us uh, what impact that had? So I can't be scientific in it. Um, I, I guess it's, it's, it's more anecdotal. I think, first of all, it made members of the, the wider team, IHSL, certainly um, Multiplex, Bouge, um anxious about what was that going to mean um, from a scrutiny point of view, where they're going to give evidence. Um, they saw me as representing Scottish government, so perhaps I knew what the terms of reference were going to be, how that went about. Um, I was able to reassure them or give them, I've been involved in, in um, a, previous, in, a previous inquiry, um, so give them some idea from experience in the past. Um, but also I do believe that it had an impact on what that, this and the wider scrutiny, public scrutiny, media scrutiny had an impact on whether or not and who came forward um, to help us resolve the works. 
Okay, so so when it was necessary to find what designers and contractors yep. to do the, the the remedial work to the the ventilation systems, y your perception was that the fact there was a public inquiry in the background was uh, sort of limited the, the the number of options you had in the market. So not just the public inquiry, but the wider scrutiny mm -hmm. and the wider the wider problems that that had been had been reported. Um, certainly a number of people would informally mention it's going to be really difficult to get people to come forward and indeed with, I, I recall um, one of the MTEC um, senior people saying that even people who had worked on the building previously who had been contractors had declined the opportunity because of workload or whatever the reason was but a contributing factor was the level of scrutiny and uh, public inquiry. Mm. Okay. Um. If we could turn then to the remedial works to the critical care ventilation, uh, you talk about this in your statement, paragraphs 45 to 53. I'm just interested in understanding the factors that made it complicated. Um, were, were those complications largely commercial, you know, associated with the, the contracting arrangements, rather than technical, or, or were there technical issues there too? Um, so, so there were contract. There were contract. There's no doubt there were con contractual commercial considerations, particularly around uh, warranties, and how was this all going to be maintained? What was the impact in the payment mechanism? There's absolutely no doubt about that at all. That was complex. We needed to make sure that whatever solution was put into place could be maintained, um, and and could cope potentially with future change of use, for example. Um, or any additional requirements that came through. Um, we had, I can't remember the timing of the report um, that HFS did in terms of fire, but a decision was made that we would install fire dampers into the ventilation system across the hospital. So we needed to make sure that, that the fire dampers didn't adversely impact upon the ventilation system because that is a concern that if you're putting dampers in in some ways you're going to obstruct and will that be adverse um, and but also technically we weren't clear or I wasn't clear until Imtech um, appointed Hor Lee what the final solution was actually going to be um, for critical care there were a number of potentials a number of possibilities but what would be the best thing um, to do to rectify that? And the other thing that was critical was actually what could we do? Because there needed to be site surveys and intrusive surveys undertaken to see what could we actually, what space would actually allow us to deliver what solution. Okay. I mean, is it fair to put it in this way, in, in both technical terms and in commercial terms, this was a challenging exercise because you were doing it at the end. In other words, after the building had been built and after all the contracts had been put in place. That's correct. Now, as well as the issues with the, the ventilation, there were other works, and you've alluded to some of those. Um, and those works were based on the assessments of the building that had been uh, recorded in the reports by NSS. That's correct. Um, how serious were these issues in terms of their potential impact on patient safety and care when compared, for example, to the, the critical care ventilation? Um, I, I guess um, I, I viewed them all as being serious and all having to be addressed. Some of those we did have as um, a, a project team within NHS Lothian um, and Oversight Board, some discussion about whether they were essential to do. So, for example, fire dampers were considered an additional improvement um, and out, perhaps out with um, extant guidance, but perhaps something that was future proofing and we had an opportunity to do it. So why wouldn't we do it taking a precautionary principle approach? Um, certainly, much of the water recommendations were well underway. Um, there were there were some pieces in there that we had debates about, but we had experts together for um, this, the Royal Hospital for Sick Children 
um, and DCN that formed a view and we gained consensus around that. So they were all viewed as needing to be addressed, answered and evidence provided that either uh, refuted the finding um, because some of the, the surveys were not intrusive, so we had to produce the evidence that had previously been, been there, um, or um, we had to undertake works in order to produce the evidence that they were addressed. And, in, and of the, the, the various works, I mean, you mentioned the fire dampers as being an improvement rather yep. than essential uh, to meet the, the, the guidance. Which other elements of the works were in the category of improvements? Um, so I think there were opportunities taken um, to do some work. So the Loch Ranza, um, uh, ventilation upgrade. There was, uh, I don't know where that actually originated from, what the origins of it were, but the opportunity was taken to address uh, ventilation in there. That's the, the hemato oncology yes. department. Yes. Uh -huh. um, we took the opportunity when we were, when, CAM, when CAMS was being looked at, um, uh, or when we put the fire dampers in CAMS and, and addressing uh, some of the, I think there were some electrical issues. Um, in CAMS um, to do other pieces um, for the CAMS staff that, that there maybe had been incidents or there had been recommendations that had come through that, that, that we, we took on board and were addressed in that space. There were some learnings from COVID and through COVID, so we took the opportunity to make some changes to the emergency department um, at that time that would be considered improvements. Okay, and if you look at it through the other end of the prism, if the critical care ventilation works were regarded as essential to comply with the guidance. Yes. Which other pieces of work fell into that category, the, the essential category? Um, I would need to go through the list of all of the actions we went through in order to be able to be accurate around that. Um, what, I mean, were, were there... The critical care ventilation works, so that was obviously a big job. Were, were there other major pieces of work, that, so far as you can recall, that were in the category of essential? I would have put Loch Ranza into that space, even though the guidance, you know, did it meet the guidance or did it not? I think it was it was critical. They, they, they had uh, resilience issues in there um, around their, their single rooms operating from one um one air handling unit that meant in order to maintain that air handling unit, you'd have to take out all of those rooms and the likelihood of having those rooms not having patients in them who required that level of care, I suspect would have been low. Mm -hmm. So I think that was an important one to do. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to say. I would have said that was an essential um, from, from my perspective. Mm -hmm. um, there was a discussion about fire dampers and, um, why would you not take the opportunity to do that and to make the hospital as safe as it possibly could be? Um, so, yeah, I, I think everything that we did really came into that. Although there were improvements made, I think they'd have been essential in the future. I think it's a timing mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd your role was was not to deal with the the migration of services in itself, but rather it was to determine when the new facility or parts of it were were ready for services to be phased in. Is that is that right? Yes. Um, and you described the phasing of the moves in your statement. So the DCN move had occurred by July two thousand, CAMS uh, in January twenty twenty one. And then the rest of the hospital was fully opened um, in March 2021. In terms of your remit, by the time that each of these parts of the hospital opened, had you been satisfied that it was a safe environment for patients and complied with applicable standards and guidance? Yes. And, and you were obviously... Um, there to exercise judgment about that, but you refer in your statement to the expertise that sat on the oversight board and to the additional assurance and expertise that they brought, and you say that that was of considerable value. Could you just expand on that, please? Um, so, the oversight, not just the oversight board, because one of the things that we did make sure that we did, we had 
and had improved upon was uh, authorising engineers throughout the, the, the duration of the pro project. The project had already had authorising engineers, but I believe they were much more heavily engaged um, throughout the remedial works than they, they had been previously. So they were more part of the ongoing advice rather than stepping in to do checks at, at, at various times. Um, but the oversight board had membership of um, health from Health Facilities Scotland, who um, provide Scotland's um, uh, experts in that area to provide advice and support. Um, Jackie Riley, um, who has international um, uh, expertise um, in healthcare associated infection, um, and also. Um, they have the, the, the teams of, of what's now Assure, but was there, High and HFS um, behind them to bring that level of expertise and a certain level of independence um, also to that space. So they provided um, scrutiny of the scrutiny and the validations that had been undertaken. Mm -hmm. So we, we covered it off from all areas. So as well as providing scrutiny, were they able to make suggestions about things and, and, and so on, or, or to provide um, technical assistance if that was needed? So absolutely, but it wasn't just the oversight board. So I would have fairly frequent conversations with, for example, Eddie McLaughlin, who was a member of the HFS team, um, or with the consultant nurses from RHI um, about a, any particular issue or particular problem to seek advice about either, actually, we've got a dilemma, what do we do about it? Or... Um, we have a dilemma, we've got a problem, where can we get the particular advice uh, that is needed to help us come up with a solution? Okay, and you, you refer in your statement that, that you didn't always agree with, uh, with these people. Um, can you just expand on that a, a little bit? What, what kind of things were you disagreeing about and how were those disagreements resolved? Um, so the disagreements were resolved by having everybody in the same room at the same time, either face-to-face -face or, or virtually afterwards, so that we could all hear each other's perspectives um, and, and have the conversation. I think I've made reference to one of the examples um, in there, which is about do we need to strip down all of the taps, for example. Um, and that was brokered by having both... Um, Lindsay Guthrie, Donald Inverarity, and the HFS and HPS teams in the rooms coming together, facilitated by by Tracy Gillis, um, so we could reach agreement on 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 the way forward with that. Um, there were some other things um, where we really wanted, where I would ask for advice, um, and was was directed back to NHS Lothian to undertake a risk assessment. Um, and I think actually the reason for that I have a better understanding about now. Um, and I think it's because there isn't one answer that fits everybody. It really is important that risk assessment is taken, uh, takes account of the patient group and, and also the nature and type of care that is going to go on in that particular environment. And just that last point that you made, is is that always necessarily going to be a feature of um, dealing with the risk of infections in the built environment, that it's, it's always going to have to be a project-specific decision-making approach? Or, or is there scope for um, imposing standards, if I can put it that way? So it would, be, it would be good if there was more certainty around the guidance and if, if, if learning could stand still for a period of time. Um, in any project, um, and particularly one with the length of time, the longevity, um, even at the Jack Copeland Centre, at the time that we were specifying our requirements, for example, at the Jack Copeland Centre, even in that period of time, there was lear new learning and perhaps changes or expected changes to 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 guidance, mm -hmm. and that always happens. Um, so it would be really good if we could get something that that actually could stand still for a period of time, and and we didn't layer on new guidance. Um, but the rate of change in healthcare, the rate of change in technology, the rate of learning around um, the built environment um, is taking place at a pace. Yeah. Okay. Now, in terms of uh, how things might be done better in the future, 
one of the things you suggest is that infection prevention and control staff should be assigned full time to pro projects of this magnitude. And you just expand on, on what you had in mind in that regard. So actually, it's not just infection prevention, I guess, and control um, staff. I think it's, it's more broadly than that. A project of this magnitude um, sh should, should have its own team who perhaps know, they, they need to know of the, the patient care, the nature of the health care um, that is going to be provided in, in the environment, but they should be dedicated to that project on a full-time basis. Uh, what I was meaning is that very often um, when you have a project, you'll have people who have a day job, which is whatever they were doing before the project came along, and they will be consultants to the project rather than an integral part of the team. Um, and they should be more consulting with from the project rather than doing their day job and being consultants into the team. And I think that's true for FIRE, for example, um, that, that we should take knowledgeable people into that space. Mm -hmm. Are you talking to some extent about clinicians in that role or is it um, um, medically qualified people that you're talking about or, or technical, technical people who's in fire and ventilation and so on? Uh, no, all of the above. So it's absolutely critical that authorising engineers are identified yeah. and are part of that and part of the, the, the team. So they're not just coming in and inspecting when work has been done and completed, that they're part of that the whole way through. And likewise, I think infection control doctors and nurses, um, or a doctor and nurse, should be, should be um, an integral part of, of that team. The reality is I think it needs a whole multidisciplinary team to be able to deliver a project. I mean, the, the inquiry has heard evidence from uh, infection prevention control professionals and, and one concern that they have is that they're, they're too readily seen as the, the default answer to every issue um, when it comes to uh, the, the infection risk of the healthcare built environment um, and, in, and in fact are starting to face demands which go beyond their professional competence. Um, how, how does one get around that? Uh, difficulty. So I think I've also said in my statement that infection prevention control doctors and nurses are in short supply. I think the demand for them um, has grown over the, over the years. There is no doubt about that at all. Um, so we do need to have more of them. Um, obviously, the the pace of uh, new builds, refurbishments will de probably decline over the next couple of years, but perhaps that gives us a window of opportunity to really decide what is needed and what we do want and how best we make sure that these issues are addressed more fully. What I think is really important and what I think came across from many, well, from examples in this project is that on the one hand you have clinicians, nurses, doctors who want to deliver health care they're concerned about their particular specialty. They're concerned about flow through department. They're concerned about how they might cohort patients. That's what's important, how to bath patients, bathe them. That, that's what their concern is. And you have then a project that's doing the built environment. They all need to come together in one space to get a shared solution to those issues and problems because that is what I think causes some difficulty. If you address the built environment issues, are you compromising something that might be needed for, for healthcare mm -hmm. delivery? If you deliver the healthcare delivery, is that of something that compromises or needs and requires a compromise um, in the built environment? And somehow they have to come together in one effort, better than they have done before. Okay. Um, and the model for um, healthcare construction projects in Scotland is that it's the health boards themselves that are responsible for those projects and, and for their successful outcome. Um, is, is that a model which you think is appropriate or are there other ways of going about it that might be better? Um, so, of course, I am now the Chief Executive of NHS National mm -hmm. Services Scotland and NHS Assure is one of my uh, departments. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I believe the accountability and the responsibility should lie with the health board. 
And the reason for that is, is NHS Assure is really about the built environment and infection prevention control. It has those two aspects that come together for the built environment. What they don't have necessarily, they will have awareness of it, but they don't necessarily know what is the nature of the patient, what is the nature of the healthcare, specifically within that hospital. So you, the reason why you build a hospital or a healthcare environment is to provide services. When people come to a hospital, they maybe see the building looks nice and it looks clean, but they're really concerned about the care they're going to receive, the treatments that they're going to receive, how fast it is. So it's about the services that are delivered. And I don't see that Assure could have the accountability and responsibility for those services. Mm -hmm. What's really important is that there is clarity of role and responsibility and perhaps um, I, I think that's something that always emerges and changes and, and as there's questions we work that through so perhaps we do need to think about that again. Um, but what is really important that we're, we, are, we collaborate and we work together. Um, we are one NHS in Scotland uh, and that's important to remember. Uh, that, that last point is perhaps uh, is perhaps the answer to this question, but is is there a risk that I mean, the aspiration with Assure is to build up a, a centre of excellence okay. and sort of group all the, the expertise together. Is there a is there a risk that in a world of limited resources and, and limited people that um, all the best people end up in Assure and then the health boards who have the responsibility of delivering the projects don't don't have the people that they need in, in their team? Um so, staff with expertise will move according to a whole range of reasons and different experiences that they might want to have. Um, job families um, in Scotland, not just um, in engineering and infection prevention control, experience a range of market pressure. So digital is quite difficult to recruit to just now. Um, and depending on geographical reasons, there may be um, more remote and rural areas who have difficulties in securing um, some particular people. So I don't necessarily believe that that is, is only true, for example, of Assure, and I get this, that, that it's in this um, set of circumstances. We have seen some movement from boards into Assure, but we've also seen quite a lot of movement from Assure into mm. NHS boards. Mm. Um, I, I understand uh, Julie Critchley will be giving evidence in, in later weeks, so she would be able to answer in more detail about what those numbers look like. But I think, I think we'll find that there is fluidity across, uh, across those spaces. It would be really great if we could have one workforce um, that had the ability to move um, and, and that were fluid. Um, we try to achieve that uh, and try to work together in support of the boards. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Ms Morgan. I've, I've run well past our scheduled end time, um, but thank you for answering my questions. It, it may be that Lord Brodie or, or some others have questions for you, but... I have no questions, um, Ms Morgan, but um, I would like to give the rest of the people in the room an opportunity to... Uh, confirm with Mr. McClellan whether or not there are further questions that would like to be directed to you. Um, I would hope that we will only detain you another 10 minutes or so, but okay. can I ask you to return to the okay. witness room? Okay. Please stand.
Thank, thank you, my Lord. There are no further questions for uh, Ms Morgan. Um, I understand there's no further questions, Ms Morgan, but which means you're free to go. But before you go, can I say thank you? Thank you for your attendance, but also Thank you for the work in preparing the uh, statement, because it's both your oral evidence and your written statement that is available to the uh, inquiry. And um, both these sources of evidence are very helpful. However, you're now free to go. Thank you, Lord Brody. Thank you. Thank you. And I should say a thank you for the attendance of everyone in the room. A longer day than um, perhaps usual, but um, thank you for being being here. Um, 10 o'clock tomorrow, Mr. McClellan? Yes, uh, with Mr. McGregor, I think. Tomorrow. With Mr. McGregor? Yes. Right. Well, we shall see each other tomorrow at 10. <clears throat>